me see if this is going to actually do what it's supposed to do this time. See if the, because everyone's, oh, oh, is it going to do the right thing? I think it's doing the right thing. Stand by. Oh, come on. Where's the video? All I see is, is, is the darkness. <laughs> Hello? There we go. I think we, we, we I think we're live. Are we live? Are we? I think I we're live. Know. Yeah, I have I'm a problem. YouTube. I, forgot. I have a problem where YouTube, what it'll do every once in a while is I'll go and like make the effort to create the pre-stream. Mm -hmm. And then I create the pre-stream. And then as soon as I start the stream, it just goes and creates a whole new brand new one and starts streaming to it. <laughs> Um, when you, so when you, you're scheduling the live, Correct. the live stream, right? When you do that, there is a key for that particular stream. Um, yep. I already made sure that one was copied in. What? Here, here's weird. what I found that works though. This is what has worked the last two times. As long as I have the dashboard open, mm -hmm. like, like on the same PC with the same IP address, as long as I have the dashboard yeah. open to that stream and then I tell OBS to start streaming, it'll do it. But if I don't open up the dashboard, like if I don't go to the YouTube website and open up that stream and yeah. I hit stream, it just creates a brand new one. So I think it's doing something on, hmm. on YouTube side where it's like, it knows you're connected to the dashboard from that yeah. PC. So then it takes the stream from that PC and associates it. You but, spelled my name wrong. It's weird. Oh shit. Did I fuck that up? It's an A instead of an oh, E. Oops. My bad. Look at that. Can't even spell my co-host name today. Some random dude out there is going to get a bunch of followers. There we go. Wouldn't that be funny if there was another, like, like, you know what? It's funny you say that because it's like somebody would go create that account just to get those follows. Oh, yeah. I've had that happen before where I'll, like, misspell something and somebody will go create that, like, my account with, like, the wrong, the wrong letter, <laughs> the wrong name. And then all of a sudden they got, like, a hundred followers and they're basically just impersonating me for a year before I find out about it. I'm going to, I'm going to buy the domain Barnacles Juan. Do it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> so that when everybody's, oh, yeah, go to YouTube.com slash Barnacles Juan. Yep. Hey, uh, yeah, we have one person chat said, hey, no David today. Yeah, no David. David, uh, he he's had to bail because he's had a rough week, and he said that today's his only day he gets off, and then he has to go back hard at it. So he's going to be doing uh, family stuff today. So I was like, yeah. you know, he's got to do that, man. Like, yeah, this this is – he is welcome here anytime he wants to come and hang out, and we nerd out with him hard, but this, this is not his obligation. Mm -hmm. This is not something that he has to plan for or anything. He's just, he just likes to jump in a lot of the time because he's just yeah. a cool-ass fucking dude that likes to talk, you know, about nerdy shit, and we're like, yeah. And we love having him here. So, but yes, this week he will not be here, but it's okay because you got the beard of sore and uh, Chubbs McFatty here to tell you all <laughs> kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> so well, actually, we've got quite a few things to talk about today. So we got, I mean, we've even got so many topics, we can't even put them all in the title. That's true. This, That's well, I'm stoked. Um, this will be fun. This, this uh, is going to be a good one. I do want to ask, I noticed the there's a cup there in the corner now. Does that actually work? It does like not. The, oh, it, I was going to say, are the super chat's going to drop in there? Well, like, actually, like, you know what? I'm not 100% sure on that. It might actually work because it is tied to uh, stream elements. But remember the bug I told you with stream elements where yeah, like, yeah. you have to delete your old account? I haven't. I, I don't want to delete my whole account because I have to basically recompose everything over on the other one. So right. I don't think it's actually working. And the funny thing is the bot is in here. Like the stream yeah. elements bot even says, look, look in chat. Yeah, stream elements. The bot is running, yet it still can't seem to figure out how to take the super chats and put them into the place. So I gotta figure I gotta figure that out. I'm, I well, I contacted them and they said that unfortunately they're, they're sending it to the developers to look at, but that doesn't mean jack shit. Yeah. Um, but they said that they would also uh like if they couldn't fix it for whatever reason, they're they're mm -hmm. like, you know, you, you might want to go just, like use one of our competing products. <laughs> like well, I mean, that's, can't they just like copy paste some database entry? That's all it is. That's all it is. One guy in a database just has to go in and remove a single relational table that has me linked to an old YouTube channel that no longer exists. Yeah, I mean, like, come on. Or actually, I'm a little surprised that you can't unlink your YouTube channel from that account and link another one. Yeah, and that's what I don't get. There's no delete. Like, like they allow you to add a channel. Like, you can add a Twitch channel. You can add a YouTube channel. You can add several YouTube channels, several Twitch channels. But once you add it, you cannot delete it. There's literally no delete option in there. The only way to get rid of it, and I even asked them to verify this, is you have to delete the entire Stream Elements account and recreate it. That's, that's the only way to delete not, those links. That is that is bad programming. That's terrible programming. Don't do that. Don't do that kind of shit. Don't be like shame Stream Elements. You. Yeah, shame. No, no. Hey, for the most part, stream element is pretty badass. Like my whole my That's whole overlays it. and everything is is run on stream elements. Um, they're pretty tight, but that is uncool that is very uncool. But that's I mean, that's that's why I use them because I mean it's it's more good than bad, right? So uh I need to tweet out the stream because of course I forgot to do that, like everything else. Um here, how do I just get the share link here from the dashboard? Ah, found it. Okay, cool. Cool, 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 cool. 
All right. Actually, everybody's going to think David's here today because the default thumbnail is from last yeah, week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all going to come in here and be like, oh, my Let God, him. we're getting our David Hill and fixes. He's not going to be here. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. We're live on TikTok. Oh, sure. We're, uh, we're right uh, now. Yeah. Big old hug emoji. It's tech talk. It's tech talk. We talk about tech. <laughs> yeah. I need to take that and run it through like a warp filter. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> hey, ran- random thought of the day. So it just popped up on my screen here. Who's this uh, lady working for Linus Tech now? Like, I- I've been noticing like tech LinkedIn stuff on Linus Tech Tips. This lady keeps showing up in all the videos. And I'm like, is she, is she new? Has she been there for a long time? Am I just dumb? Like, I think there. I so I, I can't guess remember her name because I've I only see two some, videos. I seen some tweets about it when when she like officially got hired. Okay, and I think she'd been in like a couple other videos as like a like an intern or something. But I don't follow I don't follow Linus's content enough okay. to really be able to answer. I'm sure I'm sure somebody in the chat. Will yeah, Madison. Know. That's yeah, that's her name. I just I just noticed that she was like I think she was in one video like last year. Or even more than that, I think like he did a video where they built a PC together, like for some contest or something. And I thought that she was just like a guest on the show. And then I've noticed like this last week going through because I'm subbed to all Linus's channels. You know, he's my friend. So it's like, you know, I, whether I watch it or not, I put up there. But she's showing up in all kinds of stuff now. Like was I just noticed rog, that and I was like, that's cool. Rog Rig Reboot. Rog Rig Reboot winner. Uh, she's their social media person. She was the winner of the of the OG Rog Rig Reboot. She broke the internet with the built video. She won a contest to win a building PC and the community lovers so much. Everyone wanted like oh, okay. I super. I mean, she's a perfect fit. Like I watched the videos that she's in. She's she's very, very good in front of the camera. So I was like, dude, that's badass. Like, get it. Get after it, Linus. Um, yeah, just something I noticed. Like it's what you get used to seeing certain people all the time yeah. on a channel. So like when a new person comes in, it just like stands out. And I'm just like, man, I'm I completely missed this. And then I found an old video. And she was in like a really old video that was like a year old. And I'm like, man, I don't think mm. I've seen her since. I don't watch every video though, obviously. Yeah, they, right they create now. like five videos a day. I don't, I don't have time for that. Um, but, but yeah, I just, I, that was interesting. I just brought it up because it popped up on my Facebook that there was another video that just published where she was in the thumbnail. And I was like, well, man, I'm seeing her everywhere now. <laughs> who, who isn't a streamer these days? Mind pods. That's, like, come that's on. actually a good point. Come yeah. On. Yeah. I saw, uh, oh, what was the statistic I saw last night? So I'm watching, I'm watching news on YouTube, ironically. And uh, and I saw a thing pop up said like in Minnesota baking live streamers like has spiked through the roof. Great because of the weather and because of COVID and everything. It's like everybody's just like going into the kitchen, setting up some webcams and doing like baking and cooking shows. Honestly, I think this pandemic thing really helped to push people to at least explore the idea, not just of streaming, but of of creating some sort of content whether it's it's like oh i'm gonna start a blog or i'm gonna make tiktok videos yeah. or you know all that stuff um which is great on oh, man i'm i know i say this a lot and on honestly i i parrot a lot of like gary v stuff but i i totally have drank that kool-aid i totally believe like this is a great time and you don't have to monetize you don't have to like think like oh i'm gonna quit my nine to five but if you really like something and you want to talk about it if you want to nerd out about whatever it is you're most you fucking get jazzed about man do that i i i I want i i want to see people doing their thing spreading the word about whatever it is they're they're super hyped about and i get jazzed seeing like my brother has started to get more into posting um instagram stories when he's cutting trees down and stuff and yeah I've watched I'm, a couple I'm here for it. I'm here for it it's freaking awesome I love it and 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 his the company he works for has started to do do it a bit more too I think he might be behind it but man it's great I I, I, I just think that and you can make a little bit of money you yeah. don't have to you don't have to quit your nine to five you can do it an hour a day just put like one hour instead of watching one episode of Netflix take one hour and record a video, write an article, whatever, a podcast, just talk shit with, with your buddies. I, I just, I think it's super cool. Yeah. I mean, uh, literally in this day and age, you can monetize anything. And I think, I think the whole virus pandemic oh, yeah. put people in a bunch of situations where they're and, like sitting around and they're like, I don't know what to do right now. There's like nothing to do. And then they're like, well, let, let's go explore this. We're watching it. These people are doing it. So why can't I, my excuse was always I had to go to work. Right. So it's I, like, they're like, ah. And it's free. 
you could download yeah. Anchor for if you want to do audio. Because like, hey, maybe you're not comfortable in front of a camera, or or I don't like pre-recorded content. Like I can't do the YouTube thing like you do, Jerry. I am hundred percent. Like I, I do. That. I haven't made a video there for like oh. eight months. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I, well, and again, I, I do think you and I both are live content. Like it, that's best for us at our core. Yeah. And. Uh, but that's that's me. I enjoy. I don't mind being on camera. I just don't like pre-recorded. It makes me super anxious and weird. Um, but maybe that's not your jam. Maybe you got a funny. I mean, if you got a lisp or something, that shit can be unique to you, and that can that can work for you on a podcast or something. Or but just whatever you can write or whatever. Um, but man, all it takes, and you don't even have to blow up. You don't have to be fucking ninja. Right. You no. don't have to be fucking Joe Rogan. Like, I think that's the big misconception is everybody thinks that you have to get to like this enormous size before you make it make any money or do anything. And it's like, no, not even close. You could you could look, have literally you, you could have 20 or 30. I've seen this. I've seen 20 mm-hmm. or 30 viewers on on a Twitch stream where the person was like pulling in like 100 or 200 dollars in bits and subs and follows like consistently. And I was like, holy shit, because it's just you just need an audience that you're doing something that's unique yeah. enough that they gravitate with you, you know, and they're just like, oh, this is good shit. And it works. You don't yeah. need a huge audience. I, my stepdad was over. So my lady did a dress. She's looking for her wedding dress. Right. She, so all the all the ladies went off to go help her with that. So I'm, I got to ba- not babysit, but I'm just being salty or just you know, butthead about it. But so I'm babysitting my, my stepdad. He wants to go up to Burien to go check out these. He's into like old school model trains, right? So we go up to Burien to this little electric train shop. And there's like three other old dudes in this well, older. They're like probably in their 60s or something. They're not ancient. But um, talking about fucking old ass electric trains. Yeah. Like I'm sitting there thinking, man, if these three dudes, if, if the store owner had a mic on the countertop and... And was like, hey guys, I'm just just so you know, I'm recording right now, just so just be aware. And they just like recorded their jibber jabber about electric trains, and they put that shit up on the internet. The dude, the store owner, probably could make an extra couple hundred bucks on the side because I bet there's hundreds of them, thousands of weird train nerds out there yeah. who love that shit and would and would talk about it with them. Dude, but I even watch so train YouTubers. I'm not even like a, my son's a train. He loves trains. My son is just obsessed with trains, but, but I watch this stuff and I get all like caught up in it because like this dude just like creates these like little trains in his backyard. Like Ricky Schroeder used to cruise around on and he just goes around his yard on like these little like scaled down steam trains and his like track, like cruising around his yard. And I just, every time I see that video pop up my feet, I click on it because it's just so unusual. You know, it's like the dude that built mm-hmm. the backyard roller coaster, right? Yeah, he just took a bunch yeah. of PVC pipe and made a track with like MDF and put like a, a storage box on it with some skateboard wheels and was like cruising his kids around the yard. The whole time I was watching, I was cringing like, oh, my God, those kids are going to die. But, man, it was a very entertaining video. Yeah, there's, he says, Stymie here says, there's a guy on YouTube that collects plastic chairs. That's a, that's what I'm talking about. It can be. It's almost anything. like the weirder and more obscure it is, the like better oh. chance you have of getting like a really niche audience that's going to gravitate to you because there's no competition right like yep. literally you know you actually you know the the best channel that i can think of as far as like niche that not a lot of other people have replicated properly would be um a how-to basic oh sure so okay. how-to basic like every video is like how to fix your pc how to make an omelet and it's like a really nice thumbnail but then it's just a, a naked dude that you never see his face in his hands and he starts out by like cooking or doing <laughs> something it looks legit it looks legit for the first 30 seconds like okay first you need a screwdriver and, and he's yeah. text on the screen no voice screwdriver you got to do this and then he'll like punch the motherboard and grab like <laughs> eggs out of the thing and throw the eggs onto it and then he like yeah. throws it in the toilet and then you see a stream of piss all over it like in the toilet and then he flushes it and then he'll kick the toilet and like start throwing dirt on it and it just it. It, it, it goes completely completely just out the window and it catches you off guard every time even though you know it's coming that's it's it? just this perfect form dude got millions and like some of his videos were like 20 30 40 million views that's yeah man and, that's that's it and I nobody knows it. who he is either like as far as i know nobody's figured out who he is because he just has this anonymous space that he goes and does this in and whenever he's done he cleans it up resets and does another one and you never see his face he's careful not to have reflections in anything you never see his voice all you see is like his feet and his arms and the implied nudity yeah. Like, like when he's doing stuff, like when he walks up the toilet and throws something in the toilet and starts taking a whiz on it. But it's called <laughs> How To Basic. And it's like the most weird, just funny YouTube channel. It's like the guy doesn't have to talk. 
the editing on it's like super simple. It's all jump cuts. Sure. There's no yeah. fancy punch-ins or zooms or anything. It's just jump cuts from a whole lot of footage. Uh, he has no music on his videos or anything. And then he just does like overlays if there's something that like you need a screwdriver to do this. Or yeah. First you insert this into this. It's like it's such a simple format that I bet you that guy can create those videos in just like two, three hours. Oh, yeah. And yeah. A, a video that gets like 10 million views, that's probably going to pull in a couple hundred thousand dollars just in ad revenue from one video that the guy spent three hours on. Dang so that, that return on investment is just absolutely insane. But because he was so successful at it, you had a lot of people that kind of repeated that and started getting crazy and kind of adopting that same formula and then tweaking it to their own, which yeah. is like, that's how you create new things, right? I mean, it's like mm -hmm. nobody's the first person, really. It's always, even if they're the first person for something you think they are, it's like they were inspired by something else. It's always yeah. something that inspired oh. you. Know, the first person was inspired by something, right? Right. So, so yeah, I think, I think anybody <laughs> can do that. You just have to gauge... What is your comfort level? What are you going for? And what kind of audience do you want to have? Mm -hmm. that, that That's pretty much the, the things that you have to consider when you're going to, or just don't consider any of that shit like me and just make stuff that you want to make and people will either like it or they don't, you know, it's that's that, the simplest. That's huge. So like, it has to be, it has to be stuff that you are interested in because otherwise you'll get burnt out. If you try to copy like exactly and you're not into it, like, um, to pick off of work stuff. I was just talking with um, Julian Bass, the guy who did that. My favorite superheroes, TikTok VFX thing. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? I'm sure you've seen, seen it. it. I'm I sure you've seen, seen it. it. Yeah. I'm sure you've seen it. He's a um, young black kid. And he's like, my favorite superheroes. And then he, he like, already know. Yep. I know exactly Jedi, what you're talking about. Yeah. He like seamlessly like transitions, 10. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know exactly which video so, you're talking about. That was all over like the news, man. Yeah. Yeah. He, he blew up pretty big. Um, cause like Disney retweeted him. And, and stuff. that was like um, literally his, that, that was like a tryout real thing that he was sending to Disney to get noticed. Wasn't it? Kind of like he, he did it just because that's like what he likes to do. He okay. does be a, but he did put it on Twitter and say, Hey man, if you guys like this, like try and let's try and get Disney's attention here. But I don't think, I don't think he really expected it to, to pop off the yep. way that it did. Um, but he, he was talking about, look, if, if, you know, if you're going to go into VFX, you have to like VFX. Like you have to like doing it. Like if you, if you genuinely want to be an actor or a screenwriter and you're trying to get found by doing VFX, you're going to burn out because it's boring. Oh yeah. Like you're not going to like it. So like it had, and that swings us back around the content you create, you can't just be like, Oh, somebody made a million dollars because they, you know, threw a bowling ball into a pool, like, or whatever, like that's, Sounds actually pretty fun to me, but, but like con consistent content, you have to, you have to enjoy creating the content. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or, uh, otherwise you're going to gonna stop because it's like, this is dumb. Nobody's watching my shit. I, why do I bother? And it has to be, you have to, uh, to steal from another influencer that I know. Uh, he has a podcast called in love with the process. And that's that's the core of it. You have to love doing it, not what you get from it, but what you do. You have to love the doing of it. Well, not people like, people pick up on your uh, your emotions and your feelings oh, yeah. whether you want them to or not. Like actually, that's what one of the best things that you can do as an actor. Like if you're learning, if you're going to acting school, is to learn how to suppress your own emotions or use your own emotions. Like in the scene, like if you if you want to look mm -hmm. legit sad, you have to be legit sad. Like faking that shit never comes off genuine. You have to when you, when you see somebody in a movie and they start crying and they're not using like CGI tears and stuff. That person's like, man, my dog died. Like you yeah. know they're doing they're doing whatever they can to try to be sad in the moment to project that. Right. Um, I forget what that type of acting is called. Like what is it was method, method acting. acting. Yeah, method acting. <laughs> I mean, it's rough, right? Actors like literally get like psychoses and shit from doing that stuff, but they put on an insane performance, right? Like they, Heath Ledger. Yeah, Heath Ledger is like the ultimate example of that. Um, and even like, was it uh, uh, was it Joaquin Phoenix who did the the next Joker, where he basically got down to like oh, no yeah, weight, he was yeah. like severely underweight and yeah. and had some like health issues during that thing and everything because he wanted to embrace that character, and then he used that like almost like eating disorder that he had at that point like right. to help him. I mean, it's crazy what people do. And and that's not, that's really hard to sustain something like that. Yeah. So it's like, just if, if you be yourself and you're comfortable with something or even awkward, awkward does well too. <laughs> but it's like, if you project something, people do that. If you're miserable doing something, you're just going through the paces. People know. Yeah. They, they pick up on that and, shit. And like, that's why you'll see, you'll see like, like on Twitch, um, there are characters, right? There are character streamers like Dr. Yeah. Disrespect, right? I, part of that character 
is who I think his name is Guy. That part of that character is who he is. Like there's a piece of him, his genuine self in that character, but it's it's blown up, right? He's taken Massively, it to a caricature. Yeah. It's, I've, it's I've met him beyond, in real life. He's nowhere near that jacked yeah, up and hype. It, yeah. It's beyond, but it's a piece that he's like expanded into a character. Yeah. But he's got to he has to love playing that character or it'll die. You can't keep up that fakeness forever. Yeah, you know? it's like when all the drama was going on surrounding him. It's like he just stopped. He just stopped streaming, even when he was on the platform, because it's just he, he. You you looked at him, and it was just he was defeated. And it's like no matter what he was doing, playing the game, you could just tell that he was that it was not okay. Mm-hmm. Like he was having some troubles, and so that, there's no way to suppress that stuff. You can't. No. You can try, but it it people. It will. It'll like if you're apart. uncomfortable like this is another thing too is like you ever watch a video where you're like bad stuff's about to happen like fail army or something like that and you're like cringing really bad and you actually get like that feeling in the pit of your stomach like just watching it like oh god i gotta look away like oh geez geez you know it's like it's like that, well yeah you're supposed to because that's like what they're feeling when they're going through that stuff right it's like you're watching these like complete and absolute train wrecks and it's like you kind of put yourself in their position and so you yeah, start to yeah. go, oh, man, but you can't look away, right? It's just that that's where the drama grab, you know, gets you is you're like, oh, my gosh, this is like this is this is weird and exciting. But if you mm-hmm. I've watched this, this is probably the worst thing that you can do uh, as far as advice that I can give somebody is never try to shoot a video like live streams. You can kind of get away with it because live streams, people just humanize you and it's real time and you can kind of change and move with the wind. But yeah. when you're doing recorded content, it's like if you are not feeling it and you're not enjoying it and it's getting frustrated, frustrating, walk yeah. away. Throw it mm-hmm. away. Throw it in the can. Go go create mm-hmm. a different video. Go do something else. Cancel it. Whatever it takes. Do not force content. Like, I would I would want to qualify that. Not, go for it. Don't quit on the first time you get frustrated. Any anything you do, you're gonna have those times where it's hard, where it's frustrating, where heck, I, I bet Bob Ross probably had bad days. You sure. know, where he's like, fuck, I this this didn't turn out or I don't want to do this today. That's OK. That's uh, As long as your livelihood isn't pivoting on it, take a break. It's OK yeah. to not stream a day, to to not put up a blog post this week or take pictures this day or whatever. Like that's part of loving the process, too. Right. Like your marriage isn't always butterflies and rainbows. Like sometimes you need a fucking break. I don't want to talk to you today or for this hour or whatever. Like, and that's okay. That's part of, I think that's part of the the whole thing. Yeah. Like, my, my point is just don't try not to put those moments on display unless ooh. that's something that you're willing to, to own up to and drive forward. Because I, I, I do that. I'm one of those people where it's like, I, I'm a little outside the box, but I take my licks for it big time. It's not the, sure. it's not the path to success or mental uh, sure. fortitude, but for, for, in my case, it's like I've noticed that anytime that I stream where I'm in like a really bad mood or I make a video and it's clear when I'm editing the video, like I'm even cringing when I'm editing it. Like, man, I get, mm-hmm. like I felt sick when I was doing it or I really didn't want to be doing it. Like it was something that like I really had to force myself to do. I go back and look at those videos and it is incredibly obvious to not just me, but other people reading the comments that it's like something's off. There's, yeah. so, there's something off. No. And it's like that weird. It's almost like the uncanny valley thing. But you just in the back of your head, you're like, something's wrong here. And yeah. then you could the, the content goes over your head and then you're just kind of like picking at the drama. And whenever mm-hmm. I've created those types of videos, I always get messages from people are like, man, are you OK? Like, hey, man, I watched your last video. Is that good? And it's like, yeah, no, I'm totally fine and I'm totally good. It's just it's those were videos day. that I pushed through and forced because, you know, it was important or it was like zero yeah. day and I had to race to publish to try to get the views. And 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 once you get caught up in that and you start doing that, where it's like you're constantly trying to race the news cycle. Oh. oh man, that'll that'll kill you quicker than shit, man. Yeah. Mentally, like it takes all the fun out of it. Let's hit up these super chats. Oh yeah, here. Let me here. I'll grab the first one, then you get the second one. We'll just alternate. Sure. Hey okay. Nico, thank you Nico for the two dollars ninety nine cent super chat. He said, oh, "Is this the tech support part of the stream?" Actually, <laughs> today everything went smoothly except man, for one spelling error. I, I think I think this is two now, two in a row. Yeah, was that been ninja is nice. smooth as butter? I so that's super cool. Ninja. Super OBS cool. Ninja. Okay, you can pick five. up the next one. Uh, I see what what is this? Ten pounds from Devinder Babra. I hope I said that right. Love the show, guys. Always gives me something to look forward to during the week. Hey, me too. Yeah, we we, we appreciate too. the support. We gen- and, and like we were saying, we genuinely love this. This is like yeah. our this is our social thing we do this, every week, and it's, it's a awesome. perfect example. The yeah. perfect example. If we what we're what sixty episodes? We're, yeah. We've done this over a year. Yep. Over a year, we've skipped a few here and there. But mostly my fault because I vacations and things but we've done this 
incredibly consistently because we enjoy it every moment. Yeah, it's not, that, that's the thing. It does. It doesn't feel like effort. It doesn't feel like work. Nope. And it's like it doesn't matter if we get a ton of super chats or we get a few super chats. It's like we split it up and that helps us out and gets us where we need to go. But the show itself, always we do the three hours. It's like I don't think once. Well, maybe once we stopped a little early because of something. But for the most part, we always run out the three hours. And I think that that's just really cool. It's because we like to be here. It's like we're we're, we're we're actually friends. This is not a business relationship. It's awesome. Uh, hey, Kenneth D, thank you for the $9.99 USD. He said, good afternoon, guys. How are my favorite streamers? Actually, I'm doing pretty good today. I got a Red Bull in me and I ate a Big Mac for breakfast. So nice. Nice. <laughs> uh, I was in a hurry. Uh, he said, it's my youngest daughter's 10th birthday. So hey. busy day. Just showing some love. Have a good one. Well, happy birthday happy to birthday. your daughter. To uh, Kenneth, Kenneth D's, D's daughter. daughter. There we Have go. Happy <laughs> birthday to, to you. <laughs> All right, you go ahead and grab the last super sure. chat there. Uh, oh, Dan Stark five, uh, says, just wanted to say, I have missed your man. Great to see you. Aim Aww. better. Aww. If you're missing, aim better. Two hands. <laughs> Two hands. <laughs> it says, you guys are on the wrong side of my screen. What? Uh, hold up! I don't drag, have the... drag, us, drag us to the other screen, like just just. just... Oh, because you're on the left. Oh, am I am I supposed to be on the other side? I don't even think I can you're, control. You're that. usually you're usually on the right. I I don't even think that's something that I can control with OBS Ninja. I think it just composites us in whatever order the stream joins or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah. I don't know if somebody knows how to do how to change the orientation OBS Ninja. By all means, let me know and I will I will do something about that. Uh. Normally you're on the right, Barnes. I, I just float around. I'm, I'm a floater, you know man. Yeah, it's uh, it's just the way it is. <laughs> I'm looking through chat here a little bit. Let's see. Uh, I just want to make sure there weren't any other questions. Hey, boys, looking good. Well, thank you. Thank you. I like looking good. Um, let's see here. Douglas Pocknet Jr. said, look at all the chiropractor channels riding at 5 million views. Yeah, it's weird. There is like lots of niche channels that are like everyday jobs and people just love it. They love watching it. Oh, that's a That's another point. You, you might think whatever it is, is boring. Yep. And this, this applies at a higher level. So like if you're a company that, that is trying to get into creating content for your business or whatever, you might think it's boring or that nobody's going to be interested because you make, I don't know, widgets or whatever. You can't, you can't say no for the customer, for the audience, yeah, right? You don't get to decide what is interesting. You just put that shit out there. The market is going to tell you whether or not it's interesting. And you have to gauge what you're comfortable with as far as a return, views, yeah. clicks, whatever. Um, so, and this, this does apply down to a personal level. You might think, oh, nobody's gonna care that I knit bunnies or, you know, I, I make kitten mittens right oh, there's people out there who would watch that shit 24 7 dude everything anything is interesting to some people out there oh. you just gotta get it out there and they have to find you I, I, i've said this a bunch so what i think is andy warhol once said i think that in the future everybody will have 15 minutes of fame yep boy did he call that right damn well, I, I i think it's tweaked a little bit and i think that at this point in time Everyone can have 15 fans, loyal, raving fans. Yeah, I agree. I didn't stream for almost an entire year because of the pandemic stuff and like we hadn't bought the house yet. And like I was crashing with my lady for a while and I was mostly at her house during the beginnings of this. Period. I did not stream for like nine months. The first time I came back, every all of my regulars were there, 20, 25 people. For the for my and I didn't even like shout it out. I didn't like make a big deal about it. I was like, not it was this was not some big comeback thing. Yeah. But but I have at least fifteen raving fans, people who are always there, and I and that's that warms my heart. And and it's you cool. can too. And you can too. <laughs> yeah. No. It's like it's like me. My Twitch my Twitch viewership has been absolutely rock steady for over a year now. Like where every stream I do, I have literally within 50 people the exact same amount of viewers every single stream, just because that's mm -hmm. my core group. And some people come in, some people leave, new people come, some old people go. But there's always that core yep. that sticks around. And I absolutely love it. Like I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, but but actually a good point about like weird stuff that you wouldn't think people would want to watch. 
I used to watch this guy, and I'm, I'm sad I can't remember his name because, of course, YouTube algorithm <laughs> decided to take him out of my feed because he wasn't making a lot of videos. And uh, I wish I could find him again. So if you guys know who I'm talking about, please, please put the name in chat. Uh, it's a guy who's a garbage man. He is Tell a me. garbage man, and he vlogs every day, him getting in his garbage truck and driving around and picking up his garbage. And then at the end of the day, he takes oh. all the shit that he he picks up off the curb that he thinks is a value. And he takes it home to his shop and like like goes through it and takes it apart and looks at it and talks about it. Like he's found Xboxes and Playstations and discarded computers and laptops. But he like he takes you along on his route and then he collects all that stuff up and he takes it like back to his house. You know, he doesn't throw it in the back of the truck. He puts it in, like the front seat and he takes it home and then he goes through and he's like, oh, here's today's score. And I was like, this is really cool because he's like dumpster diving, but he's the garbage man. And it was a yeah. really, really cool a... vlog. I watched, dude, I watched everything he made for like a, a year. There's a Twitch streamer that was doing that, like in yeah, this in guy Midwest yeah somewhere yeah, this guy also Twitch streamed yeah. I watched his videos that like was he, fun. He, he'd publish them on actually, YouTube. Yeah, yeah, that was fun. What was his name? If you guys know who I'm talking about, let me know because I want to go back and like give him a follow again because you, YouTube has done this is one thing I really hate about YouTube. I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here is that I find a video in my feed after not seeing a content creator for like a year. I'm like, where did they go? Did they die? Mm -hmm. Like what happened? And I forget about them. And then one day, like there another one of their videos will pop up on my feed, just completely random by happenstance. And I click on it. It says that I'm no longer subscribed to their channel. When I was a loyal subscriber for literally ever, they've unsubscribed me from Cody's lab like 10 times now. I've been unsubscribed from, but I have to go back to his channel and click resub every time because when his videos don't show up, because I know he makes regular content. When a video mm -hmm. doesn't show up for like a week or two, I'm like, dude, I know Cody released another video. So then I go back to his channel, I'm unsubbed again. Are you engaging? Nuts. Like, yeah, do I you comment, every, like, and all that stuff? No, well, I'm just yeah, watching. I like, I like, and I watch everything he makes. Mm -hmm. I don't comment, though, because I'm watching on my TV, right? So I'm sure, just, sure. But, but I do make it a habit to like on the TV, you know, go up and hit the three dots and go over to thumbs up. I do that, you know, but I was like, why the hell does it keep? And it's not just him. It's other channels. Like, I watch Daily Driven Exotics like crazy. It's these guys up in oh. Canada that just drive supercars, you know, through yeah. the snow and shit and do Brodies and, you know, make all the supercar owners wince. <laughs> and, and I love their content, right? They have good personalities. Good, uh, they're good vloggers. Like, like there's some vlogs that I like to watch. They they've cracked the nut for me. I I like watching it. But uh, they keep falling off my sub list too. Like I'll just be going through my videos for like you know subscriber feed, and I don't see their videos for a while. And then I notice that all their videos are missing out of my feed. Like even their old ones from like a couple days ago. They make a video literally like every day, every day or two. <laughs> And I'm like, where the fuck does this goes? So I have to go into search on my TV and find daily driven exotics and click on it. And then it shows them unsubbed. And then I sub again. And then all their stuff shows up. I'm like, why is YouTube <laughs> unsubbing me from everybody that I watch the most? Is it, are, are they trying? They is me. it because I watch them so much that YouTube's like, we'd rather make them disappear for a while. So you're forced to go watch some other people to spread it around. Like I'm trying to figure out what the logic is behind the algorithm. Just randomly unsub you. And then there's some channels that you don't ever watch that you're still sub to. Like there, there's there's a dozen or so channels that a video will show up. They make a video like once a month and I'm still sub to them. And and they never and I it never unsubs me, even if I miss their video, even if it's a video I don't watch, it'll still they'll still be sub to them. So I, I'm trying to figure out if one, it's it's some purposeful algorithm to change my viewing habit, or if it's just I'm super, super unlucky and YouTube keeps like crashing and going to backups like right after I sub a person <laughs> and I lose all those subs. It, it's so weird, man. It is so weird. But I've had people message me constantly on Twitter saying, oh, dude, I, I didn't see Tech Talk because I was unsubbed from your channel. I don't know what happened. Oh, and it's like weird, but it happens all the time. I get that all the time from people saying, oh, I was unsubbed. Oh, my God. Why didn't I get a notification when you went live? Oh, I was unsubbed. And these aren't people that like, you know, accidentally unsubbed from the channel. These are people that right. have been around forever. Many of these are even my personal friends. And they're like, holy shit. Like, I, I thought, you know, you're still doing Tech Talk. I thought you stopped that like four months ago, you know, just because they're not active on social media. So it's it's very, very bizarre how the algorithm works. And I don't think anybody can really explain it end to end because nobody has the whole formula. So yeah, it's a little it's right? a little bizarre. It's a little bizarre to see that. But I again, want to shout out somebody real quick because this would be really fun. Uh, you can share your screen, right? Uh, me? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure I can figure it out. I would like to take a, a one minute and let's watch Stealth ESW's first video. Stealth ESW. Yep. Stand by. All smooshed together. Okay. So stealth. Because ESW. where'd he go? Where was the line in chat here? Where is it? He said, getting Barnacles to watch my first YouTube video would be epic. Oh, we're going to do that shit right now. Live on stream. His first, his first video is 11 and a half minutes long. So I don't really want to watch the whole thing. We'll jump. We'll jump through it. <laughs> but I thought that would be nice. 
I think that that is a nice. Actually, that's something we should do every week. Is showcase somebody. I like that. All right. So let me add. Uh, let me see. I need to do a screen capture. Where is the it? all new 2021 Ford Raptor has some awesome upgrades. Is that is that his? Oh yeah, it's I see it. Title. I see it. So here, let me make sure. Okay, is that working? So I mean, the preview thing. looks pretty sick. Did you record this, or are you like? Did you cut this out of like a commercial? Because this is some pretty quality footage in the first 10 he, seconds of this. Is he in chat? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Make make sure he didn't like, you know, steal that. No, no, he's here. He okay. said, um, okay. Okay. Well, no, I just I just want to make sure that he didn't like steal content. We're gonna get DMCA if I show his stuff. <laughs> yeah, that, that's part of why I'm asking. Like, yeah, because this is some this I mean, I'm 30 seconds into this video, and this is like commercial quality stuff. Like this is good. This is like Graham Graham Lang drone footage stuff. This is great looking. If, if he already. actually, oh yeah, I see it. If he actually made he this, says, this is insane. He says I got the footage from Ford Media. So this is this is public stuff. Yeah, like as long you, as it's in the media junket, I don't stuff. care. So all okay. right, here we go. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna watch this. Let me uh, let me get it so it's sized correctly, so we're not cutting a bunch of it off here. Dude, it's dude, footage dude. released to the media. Okay, perfect. All right, it's let me perfect. do a transition. You guys ready? <laughs> Three, two, one, it. transition. Okay, can you guys see it? All right, let's uh, hit play. Oh. In today's well, like video, I'd like to go over our, some of the changes stream, so. in the new 2021 third generation Ford Raptor. The Ford Raptor signature look has been refreshed for I the do 2021 want one of those. model year with redesigned front marker lights, power domed hood with heat extractor, LED headlights, and fender flares that fit very well with the Raptor line of F 150s. Well, got my car gas and The front <laughs> fenders include a functional side vent inspired by the F-22 Raptor to aid in heat extraction and the rear bumper has been redesigned to allow a larger full-size spare tire to be fitted. So let's get started. There's a lot to cover. I may not cover everything due to there being so many changes, but I will try to hit most of them. The most significant change is the redesigned rear suspension of the all-new 2021 Ford Raptor. Incorporating a five-link design that allows for improved wheel travel stability and control. I drive that. The five link has been developed specifically for the new that Raptor and includes extra long trailing arms, a pan hard rod, wow. and coil springs. That's right. Gone are the leaf springs of the previous model. The replacement being 24 inch coil springs coupled with improved Fox live valve shocks. I didn't even know Fox, Fox made is shocks introducing for the next generation like live valve internal bypass shocks designed for the all new Ford Raptor. These are the largest shocks used on the Raptor so far at 3.1 inches in diameter and are designed to resist heat buildup and react to changes in terrain much faster degrees, max departure of 23.9 degrees Damn and a breakover of 22.7 degrees. The Raptor 35 will be 79.8 inches tall overall with a track width of 74 inches. From you know what? This is actually kind of proving our point we were talking about earlier. It's like he's just doing voiceover on a microphone. He got all the footage from a press junk and edited it together. And he basically created like his own review, like his own Doug DeMiro review without ever even having to like own the vehicle or go have a test track. I think that's cool. Yeah. yeah. Front and 73.6 uh, inches. Are we going to keep rear. watching or well, I'll watch a little bit, bit more here. Okay. I, I, I kind of like trucks. I'm a truck Each guy. Each mode so. will adjust. Okay. After RB8 from the GT500. Oh, now we got some sound in there too. All right. That doesn't sound like a truck. It sounds like a Lamborghini. Jeez. Yeah, dude, the, the Raptor is a beast. Well, shit, son, that's cool. Yeah, no, that's, I mean, yeah. that, that's awesome, yeah. dude. I, I like the, so the things I like about it you now, because we're going to give our, our live critique here now. Yeah, you know, watch my, my only nitpick, um, I would record the audio. It's first there were some there were some pauses where you could tell like you were reading from like a, a script um that's it just some some weird I pauses I in a in a sentence where like you had to you looked like you either looked back down to your paper or something like you could tell there was a pause in a sentence but otherwise that was great you got a good voice it was recorded very clean that audio was it was very nice very good um would you like have a blanket over your head and get that no echo kind of thing because yeah, like, there wasn't a lot of background dude, noise I, he does need a pop filter though because there, there was, was a lot of a, a lot of the you know the you know when you don't have but, the, the pop, pop, pop filters are amazing get a pop filter like, make one and this cheap cheap like nine dollars like yeah. this thing this was nine dollars on 
on eBay. Yeah, don't get the don't or get the nylon Amazon. ones though. Those things get like really nasty. Like really, get a metal one. Get a metal one that you can just like hose off under your. Mine's faucet. Got, I think mine's got like a metal mesh and then like a foam thing behind it. Oh yeah, mine is pure metal. This this thing, it's just two layers of metal and they're offset just enough that the air can't pass through it without without getting broken up. But this yeah. is made by Rode. You can buy it without the microphone. Like it's just a standard shock mic holder thing. Yeah, dude. So my, that was good. That was really I, good. I have a few recommendations though to, to grow your game. By the way, is he uh, another thing too? He, he's all upvotes. Everybody that's watched that video liked it. Nice. There, there's that's, no downvotes on the video, so I think that's awesome. Um, actually, I'm going to give it. It's 14. I did like. I did. So yeah, um, I, did, I did one too. So what I would do is one, I'd add some music in there. The reason I'd add mm -hmm. music is because when there's no ambient sound from the vehicles driving and stuff like that, having the sound in there actually like emphasizes your voice, and stream and it tells somebody how to feel. Like when stream beats, stream beats has. 100% royalty free um, music of, of various kinds. There's like ambient, there's EDM. They just recently did like a rock Ooh. album, um, Stream Beats by Harris Heller. And it's all free. You don't have to credit him. You don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to do anything. You could just use it. It's 100% royalty free. Dude, that's awesome. I'm going to have to mm -hmm. check out Stream Beats. I don't, I don't think I have. They're great. So, so yeah, I would just say, um, I, I would just say put add some music in the background, some of the royalty free music to kind of set the mood. And, you know, you can even change it up through some of the jump cuts too. like use two or three, four different tracks throughout the video. Your that, voiceover is really good. But for a pop filter, literally, if you're using a headset microphone, all you really knew is take the headset microphone, pull it away from your mouth, move it to the side like this, and then just amplify it in post. Like when you're doing the editing, just go in and bring the volume back up and add some bass in. And you'll get a similar effect to having a pop filter or get a dead cat and put it over it. That works too. Like I, so this is a HyperX uh mic for this HyperX headset but this this fuzzball is actually from a road video mic you that's can, hilarious dude and i and i zip tied the shit out of it to to get it to stay under the because it's normally supposed mic. to go over like a tube right like, like yeah a, yeah it's a like a the road sh little oh actually i have it it's this it's supposed to go over this wait the little with, road road with video Winter mic Gatton is royalty free i didn't know that cool Oh, Even geez, I, lo I love his music. There's, it's really unique, really unique. But yeah, yeah. So there you I go. Mean, you I, just got showcased on Tech Talk, dude. There you go. We I should, wouldn't, we should, we should I wouldn't that say that I'm a pro, Miss Liz, but uh, I have opinions. Well, here's, <laughs> here's the thing: is everybody's a pro to somebody. That, 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 that's the way I look at it. It's like there's always somebody who's better than you, but there's always somebody who can value you can get value from where you're at or what you yeah. made, right? And that's true. That's another thing I think a lot of creators forget about is it's like I and honestly, this is probably one of the biggest breakthroughs I've ever had personally uh, when I was making regular YouTube content, not even just live streaming, just YouTube content is I would stop myself from doing simple things mm. because I would assume that everybody knows that. And I would be like, Don't. this is embarrassing because everybody's going to be like, dude, everybody knows that it's so simple. But I proved myself wrong on many, many, many different occasions. And what you think might be simple because you know it and all your friends know it and all your friends' friends nope. know it. I guarantee you that 90% of the rest of the world has no fucking clue it exists. The, the number one most viewed and commented video from Puget Systems is how to enable or how to enable and or initialize and format a new hard drive yeah it's it's like a three or four minute video there's no frills to it it's literally just this guy um just talk it's it's hey i'm chris from puget systems and we're going to initialize and format your drive and he walks you through it on windows 10 it's like a six-year-old video four-year-old video yep. and consistently the most commented on thank you so much oh my god this was great just simple straight to the point i love that you guys didn't talk too much it's just this is what you do and that's it like 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 comment come every single day i get at least two comments on that video yeah it's not my video but it's puget systems video but i'm the social guy so i look at that shit but this is the simple stuff don't make people feel stupid do your best to just present facts and, and information um or i mean opinion is good too because you Just know don't be condescending it? purposefully condescending or arrogant yeah, because that usually doesn't man. play well with people learning stuff yeah don't again that, that comes back to that don't don't say no for the audience right you don't that's not for you to say that's that's for the the market the audience is going to tell you if this is worth or not yeah but dude hype hype little um yeah, you're saying you use windows windows recorder i would recommend audacity it's oh, free big time big time it's yeah. free and, and pretty powerful it's a little weird and confusing you're gonna see that it's a terrible ui but it is it's free 
it's it and it and it's really good for just simple recording adjusting like audio stuff um cut 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 you can just snip things and smush things together um it's like yeah. adobe audition light basically yeah yeah but good job man super yeah. cool yeah no and that's the other thing too is like just adding in like a little, little things like a little bit more mid and a little bit more bass to your, to your <laughs> microphone you can have a crappy microphone and still make yourself sound amazing like in post so play around with audio settings and see what you can do to make that microphone sound a lot better yeah there's there's some really good um like listen to what tutorials. i sound like with no eq What's yeah what <laughs> i could do the same so this is what i sound like with no eq guys so, so this this is this that's, is what, that's what jerry sounds like in real life that's what i sound like actually, well, actually, hold on hold on hold on so this okay so th this would be neutral yeah. So this this is completely neutral. That was pulling a bunch of trouble and stuff out. But this is completely neutral. But watch what happens when I just add in a little bass and just a ton, or a lot of bass and a little trouble. Now all of a sudden I'm like, hey ladies, oh. how's it going? You know what I'm uh, saying? Yeah. Like I'm it. afraid to touch any of my knobs. <laughs> yeah, don't so even touch you're just your knobs, gonna dude. you're just gonna listen to who, who, the way I am right now. Yeah. So you can you can I do a I'm lot okay. with EQ, but but uh, back to the point of things that people know like i can prove this every time i do this demonstration all the time on my on my live stream and i've done it on twitter probably i don't know 50 times now in the last two years how many people in here in chat know that if you're running windows 10 or even i mean if you're running windows 10 hold down the windows key and press period oh the emotes how yeah. do you how many of you i guarantee you that there's somebody in chat right now that's like holy shit like that i can do emotes like Wow, watch this. And we have we have 415 people in here right now. I guarantee you every time I give this tip, a bunch of people are like, I didn't know that. And it's the same, it's like literally every time I'm streaming. So you'd expect mm -hmm. it's the same group of people, but there's always enough turnover and enough people watching one that missed the other one that people are still like, oh my God, that's a real thing. And uh, and so people Wait, always what? get mad on t when I do tech tips on Twitter. I'll be like, oh, did you know if you hold down Windows key and V, you actually get the 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 paste, the paste clipboard so you can have more than one paste. You can actually paste anything you copied like previously. And people are like, what? You can do that in Windows? What? You know, and it's like, but I've given that same tech tip like five times. And the first comments when I posted are like, dude, you posted this a year ago. This is stupid. You're just rehashing old content. But everybody to believe beneath it are like, oh my God, dude, I just started following you. Holy crap. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah. So don't ever listen to the people that are like, just because they know something or they learn something that there's no value to everybody else. And a lot of people mm -hmm. get stuck in that. I've had so many people be like, I don't want to create that video because everybody else has already done it to death. I don't want to review that because there's already a million review videos on that. No, 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 no. But there's only one video of you doing it. And you may be the person that they're going to watch where they wouldn't find anybody else because they're finding you through a different, you know, type of content or or a different, you know, your personality may be the draw. But yeah. but just yeah. never put yourself in that in that corner where you're like, you know, I'm not going to do something because it's either too simple or it's, you know, there's no complexity to it. Everybody, everybody knows it. People are going to think that it's stupid that I'm that I'm doing this because it's so simple. No, no, no. Some of my some of the most popular stuff I've ever done is really simple and easy to follow things that people just had no idea existed. Yeah. Like my shortcuts video that I did. People absolutely love that. I just did a video. All, they're all published. Every shortcut in that mm -hmm. video is published on Microsoft's website. If you go look for Windows 10 shortcuts, but a lot of people aren't going to go look for Windows 10 shortcuts or they're not even going to know about them because they're doing everything yeah. with the mouse. They watch a video and they see that. And then it kind of like they're, they're like, wow, you can do this. Hey, when's the next shortcut video going to be? You know, what other things can you do? And you'll eventually get the snarky comment every once in a while. It's like, oh, I knew fuck all em. these. You know, it's like, no, fuck them. Like, you know, that's that's not why I do this. I don't do this to like just impress the one person. I do this so that the people that don't know about watch it. If you're watching mm -hmm. the video and you mm -hmm. already know all these, why are you watching the video? <clears throat> yeah. It's Windows 10 yeah. shortcuts. If you know every Windows 10 shortcuts and you're watching the video, and you're putting the comments. This is dumb. Everybody knows all the shortcuts. No, everybody doesn't know all the shortcuts. Right. You know, right. it's like so just. Think about that next time that you're trying to make any kind of content. Don't talk yourself out of it because I've done this. I've done it before. I've talked myself out of content. Hey. Be like, oh, all the other YouTubers I know have already done this. They've already given their perspective. Like, I don't mm -hmm. want to put it out there, but he's going to be like, oh, did you know somebody already did a video? Because they'll, they'll do that. You'll create a video and a bunch of people will be like, oh, the other video guy that you collaborated with did this video. You're, you're, you're doing it after him. It's like, yeah, but I'm also doing it from a completely different perspective. I'm a completely different human being. And people like variety. They, they like variety in the people like I'll watch 10 videos on the same product so that I have yeah. contrast. Well, and that's it. Like, like, oh, I can't do I can't do a GPU review because Gamers Nexus already did it. Look, yes, Gamers Nexus, very comprehensive. They're super science guys. I love how they they do data driven content. It's great. And Steve is fucking cool, dude. Yes. But you have you have like it's not just the data. 
right? It's how you present it. It's your your interpretation of the data, whether that means something to you and and the rest of your audience. I play games. I play I played Cyberpunk like a month after everybody else was playing Cyberpunk. I still haven't played I it. Give, I don't care. <laughs> I, need people, to. I, I like it, and people like the way that I react to it. Yeah. It's not it's not the game necessarily. Sure, it's fun to watch somebody, you know, the the actual like gameplay and and like walking through the story and all that stuff but like it's 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 it is you it's like there are people who why do you think why do you think there are news outlets multiple news outlets all talking about the same topic because everybody's got a different spin on it yeah and and that's that that's why you have an audience is because they enjoy your particular spin on whatever the content it is that you're creating yep it's like it's like when i watch it i'll watch a video where somebody does a product review like steve is a good example steve goes really deep he mm-hmm. goes really deep. And if you want a really good deep technical kinda... video, yeah, but that's it. That's just it. As I watch some of it and I'm like, you know, I want to know three of the 5,000 things you just did. And <laughs> yeah. so what I'll do is I'll go watch another video that's just some regular dude taking it out of the box, putting it in and playing like one or two games with it. And like just emphasizing on the game experience, just playing mm-hmm. that game. Mm-hmm. No, not talking about frame rates, not talking about thermal throttling and putting probes on and everything. He's just like, I stuck this in my computer. This is my average user experience, like what's yep. happening with it. And then you see stuff that doesn't come out in the more professional video because this focuses more on the experience of playing the game rather than focusing on old oh, frame skip, certain settings, DLSS. It's like, this is what it looks like if, to just install the damn thing and play the game. And yeah. I like that. Like I mean, yeah. for me, my, my ADHD brain, it's like there's times where that video is more important to me than the huge technical overview. Or as an example, for my own, like, at least goal with content, um, I watched a review from Hardware Canucks on a case that I was wanting to buy. I liked the review that they did. It seemed like it would fit my my use case. Like, I, oh, this is good. I, this It's cheap. It's good. It's small. It's what I want. I bought it. I started building in it and encountered some issues that were not mentioned. I sh- Maybe I could have found more reviews or whatever, but that's when it clued me in. Nobody's really doing build reviews, right? They, they, there's a mention of like, oh yeah, it's kind of tight to get your hands in here, the wiring, blah, blah, blah. But like the issue I ran into, the case build itself as, as good for AIO, right? I tried to put a Corsair HD60 into this thing and the tubes got bent, it's 120 millimeter AIO, like a pretty and and small. It's pretty short tubes. Like these aren't like monster freaking things trying to go outside of your case. And I could barely get the thing closed. Had somebody like worked through an entire build with with that in mind, I would have known. I probably still would have bought the case, but I would have known ahead of time, and it wouldn't have been as as hard and frustrating for me uh, to do that. And so that's what's like. Hey, I can do that. I'll start just doing full builds from start to finish. And, and you guys can see the struggles that I have. I'm, I am an experienced builder. I have literally built thousands of PCs from ATX to ITX to servers to quad Xeon monster Frankenstein shit that we put server boards into a tower. Okay. I've only done that twice, but still I am a pretty experienced builder. I've worked for a PC, a boutique PC manufacturing company. I still do, but like, I know what I'm doing. And so like, like I'm excited to build in this thing. This is going to be, this is going to be super cool. I'm stoked. I want to do this one fancy pants, but like, Nobody else out there doing full on builds like that, or that not that I could find, and so I kind of lost. Yeah, what I was. <laughs> <laughs> You're like a mom in the tool. Hey, Lord Zero, thank you for that ten dollars super chat, stuff. man. Those super chats keep us going. Thank you. I said, love you guys. Thanks for being awesome. Hey, we try, man. We try thank to you. be awesome. Yeah. I did see. I did see a chat question. Said it's getting harder and harder. I think it was from Clay. Yeah, it's getting harder and harder to find good people that aren't just shilling products. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Now, no, I got something to say. I think you'll, you, this will be a good contrast between us. Everybody is going to be a shill on some level, some level. Either they're going to have brand loyalty, right? Where they're going to give a lot of, even if there's no money involved, they're just going to give a lot of weight and excuses to that company just because they like their products and they like their brand and their brand loyal. I see that with Apple all the time. I've seen that with Android, even in even specifics like Samsung. I've seen sure. people like Samsung is the only Android phone. Everything else is in superior. It's like, no, dude, that's not true. Fuck off. So... The problem is, is there's different levels of that, right? So you have the people that are brand loyal. You have the people that get shit for free. Like, you know, they said literally NVIDIA sent me a GeForce RTX 3080. 
That's a thousand dollar graphics card. Am I going to stick that in my computer and say this is a piece of shit? Fuck it and throw it in the garbage? No, I'm, I'm not. Like, I know, well, already know it's a good card. That I would already... be objectively false. No, no, but here's, here's the thing. Here's the, no, oh, yeah, I'm not going to go that direction. <laughs> but but I, have to, I have had to do that before, speaking of which. So I, I do have some street cred as far as shitting on the company that feeds me. But the thing is, I won't take any money for it. I don't sign any contract. I just, I, I asked them if they would send me actually a much lesser card. And they're like, oh, why don't we send you a 3080? I'm like, my God, you're awesome. So, so the 3080, I already know it's a good card. I've already used it before. So I know what to expect. But again, it would be stupid to expect that when I review this thing, I am going to be 100% objective and not have any bias towards I've used NVIDIA forever, having used AMD products in forever. Doesn't mean one's better than the other. No, but this is what I'm used to. This is my ecosystem. This is what I work with. Um, I do crypto mining, right? Which is which AMD is supposed to be a lot better at. But I have a machine behind me with a bunch of NVIDIA cards in it because I'm an NVIDIA guy. I like NVIDIA. Don't like the company, what they do sometimes, but I like the products. Um, then you're going to have the people that are a step above, above that, where it's like they have a sponsorship. They're literally profiting or making money off of reviewing the product. Now they can't be, they, they can't really be objective. That's a, that defeats the point. They're signing a contract, literally saying, I will do these things in exchange for money. At that point, then it's an ad. At that point, it's no longer objective. Once you get to the point where it's like that person is an ambassador to that company and they're signing contracts and they're like, listen, I can't even review other people's products. It, at that point, it's like you really are watching them for entertainment value. I mean, they're literally, it's the same as watching a commercial for the company. But my point being is just watch a whole bunch of different videos from different people across that entire landscape, because you're going to hear things from the person who's sponsored and makes a lot of money, even though they're going to be incredibly biased towards the, why the product is the best. You're still going to hear about the features of the product. You're still going to hear about the specs. You're still going to see it. You're still going to get a lot of information out of that. But if you want negative information and the pros and the cons, that's not the person to go to. So you want to contrast that with somebody else. Sometimes I'll even I'll even watch a review that is incredibly negative about a product just for contrast. Oh yeah. So like even if I want a product really bad, like like this mixer board. When I went when I went and bought this mixer board, I went and looked it up, found another review where the guy was like, "Oh my god, this is the best thing ever. It gives me ten channels. It's so fucking amazing." And I was like, "Oh my god, I'm gonna buy it." But I was like, "No, I'm gonna go watch a couple more reviews." And I found another guy that's like, "Oh fuck this thing and Windows Seven. The driver never fucking loads. And you gotta go to Yamaha's website and download the Steinberg audio driver and force load it and edit an INF to get it working." And I'm like holy shit this guy's like do not buy this it's absolute garbage so i'm like whoa okay maybe i shouldn't buy this mixer so then i went and did more research and it's like this is a problem that only exists on like windows 7 and yeah. it's a very specific issue i don't run windows 7 i run windows 10 so and even at the time when i got it i did so so i was like this is a non-issue for me but by watching his video i got to see the perspective of somebody that's in an environment where this thing does not work so anybody that watches that guy's video that's running windows 7 or or whatever this specific configuration was they're going to know to stay the fuck away from that thing but it's a non-issue for me, and it wouldn't be even if I reviewed it without any bias whatsoever because I don't have the environment that causes the problems. That's why you should look at a lot of reviews because you might oh, have yeah. somebody that's like, dude, this graphics card is so fast. Oh, my God. It's the and you're like, man, you get the graphics card, and all of a sudden it's slow as shit, and you're like, why? Oh, because Context. in his video, he had different PCI. He had different different chipset. He had different generation of CPU. He had faster memory. Like, none of that got factored into it. He's just like, oh, I throw this card in my computer. It's like, now your system's bottlenecking the shit out of it, and you weren't expecting that, right? So it's yep. good to watch reviews of, I want to see a guy who reviewed the card on the best computer, and I want to see a guy who tried to shove this thing into, like, a third generation, like, i7. Yeah. Exactly. And, and see how it does and then you kind of contrast that together so don't mm -hmm. don't buy something just because you watch this actually a great example this is this right here i just bought this this is a gopro Ooh, hero GoPro. 9 black i've been wanting one of these forever it's the like, nine nice it's the nine dude it is it is awesome it's got trust me it's got its fair amount of flaws too but it is an awesome camera but i went and watched 10 different reviews the day before i watched this <laughs> and the reviews varied from this is the greatest camera ever made. Like you can throw every other camera away and do an entire production with this thing to a video of this is the shittiest fucking action cam ever. Stay away from it. It's garbage. And the thing is, when <laughs> I watch this entire gamut of videos, you start to notice something. The guy that's saying that this is absolutely a piece of shit thrown in the garbage. His second action cam is like a $3,000 Sony with like a prime lens on it and like a big metal cage protecting it. It's like, you know, for like shooting studio work. And I'm like, you oh, can't yeah. do this is $400. You can't compare this to that. But that's what he's used to. So when he bought it, he was expecting that it would be similar. But he's like, no, no, man, it's garbage. And this doesn't work in the, the fucking menu system or whatever. It should be physical buttons. And I'm like, okay, so that guy obviously doesn't like that. He's not who's his marketing to. But by watching that, I understand that those aren't features I care about. So, those, so, so what I do is I watch a whole bunch of videos and I look for the features that I care about and what people are saying about those specific features. And then that gives you the, and then that gave me the confidence to go and buy this little guy. So... By the way, if you do want to buy one of these, go to GoPro site. Don't go to Amazon because GoPro, for some reason, is doing this weird thing where you sign up for like a year of their cloud service and then they reimburse you and then give you another $50 off and you end up getting this for 
I think like 350 bucks or something like that. Nice. And then you can buy another one for $250. This will do 5K and 1080p at 240 and 4K Dude. at 60. And the image stabilization is intense. It's insane. On those so, things. And removable, removable lens covers now. Look at that. Isn't that cool? So the old, the old GoPros, you'd always scratch the lenses and then you had to literally use a heat gun to get the damn things off and replace them. This thing just screws on there and it forms a watertight seal. So in the whole thing, you don't need a case. It's watertight right out of the box. Screen on the front, screen on the back. So GoPro is really, really good at the action cam market. They have nailed it. Like this, you buy this and then you buy the, they call it a media kit. It's like a cage that goes around it that puts a shotgun mic on it, a yep, mic yep. out and an HDMI out. And it basically becomes a vlogging machine. Mm -hmm. Like, like I can't think of a better like vlogging camera setup. It's like, take this thing. Um, it even comes with like a little handle. Like if you buy their kit for like another, I think it's 40 bucks or whatever. It comes with a handle, an extra battery, a memory card, a bunch of extra little add-ins and mounts. But yeah, this thing just, you just mount it left like this and it's like super light. It floats. So if you drop in the water, you're not going to lose your GoPro. And the other thing, if you buy it from GoPro, the, if you do the, the $49 year, by the way, I'm not paid for any of this. I don't even have an affiliate with GoPro. Uh, so I'd actually make more money if you went and bought it from Amazon. I don't make anything if you get it from GoPro, but I'd still say get it from GoPro because they have they have a replacement. You know what the replacement policy is? If you pay the forty nine dollars a year, hmm. anything, Great. no questions asked. OK, sure. L literally, I was looking through the forum. They're like, what if I run my GoPro over with my car? They're like, we don't care. All you have to do is is send them a picture of the camera destroyed and then they will fucking send you a new camera. You put the bits into the box and send it back to them. That's sick. No questions asked. I was they like, probably take seen. all the good parts and then it's a refurbished one that they can probably, you know, probably. sell for for eighty percent. But know? still, like, how much confidence do you have in your product where you're like, it's so durable that you're like, you're not because if everybody broke one of these and had to send it back twice, they'd be out of business. Yeah. So they have a lot of confidence that these things can survive a lot of abuse if they're like, oh yeah, if it breaks, no questions asked, we'll just send you another one. I'm like, what? I think that's pretty damn cool. I love GoPros. GoPros are awesome. Hey, Pop. What's up, my man? Thank you for the $5 super chat. He said, hope you're all well. I got my first Moderna dose. Nice. Congratulations. He said, because I'm a vocational instructor to school IT. Would Windows using Linux kernel affect app compatibility? Um, Yes and no. If you're using WSL2, you can have problems. If you are running it as a virtual machine, as a pure virtual machine, then yeah, you'll have 100% compatibility. You won't have any problems with app compatibility. So something to be aware of because i know wsl2 isn't like 100 percent uh compatible yet like like microsoft adds more in each update but it's not 100 percent there like even, even if you install i think what are the support excuse like debian and there's like two others that you can install on wsl2 but just realize that that side-by-side -side kernel stuff you might not have 100 percent app compatibility but it's going to be bare bare hardware you're running right on the hardware at the same speed you would basically if you're running linux native give or take um, but if you're running it under a VM, which is what I'd personally do, mm. just run, just run Linux under a windows 10 hypervisor and you'll have hundred percent app compatibility. And honestly, unless you're doing stuff with like crazy 3d graphics and stuff like that, um, you'll probably be just fine. Yeah. That's what I'd do. And thank you, pop. We appreciate the super chat, brother, brother. But yeah, no, that was a, that, that that's, a, that's a good conversation. I, yeah. I, 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 oh, wow. Nigel. I, Here, you get, like... you get Nigel's super chat. Grab, grab his. Uh, oh, oh, Nigel, right on. Nigel Wotan. 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 I like I Wotan. Know. Sounds Wotan. badass. <laughs> uh, hey, guys. Da, 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 da. Can't watch till tomorrow. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Just want to drop in to show my support. Da, 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 da. Take care. Thanks, man. You are awesome. Thank you so much, man. We really like do those, appreciate it. I like those dramatic pauses you put in there. Hi, guys. Yeah, Krillin said the Can't GoPro Hero tomorrow. 9 bundle is 399 Really? Nice. That's even cheaper than I thought it was. So, so just to give you guys a context here. So look, so these are my two cameras, right? That, that I use for, well, this is what I use for everything now. I, I literally yeah. retired this. I'm just, so if you know somebody wants to buy a $3,000 camera, let me know because I'm retiring that. I'll give you $100 for and, it. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, like, nice try though. So, so this right here is an RX100 Mark 7. These retail for about 1200 bucks. It does 4K 30, 1080p 60. Nice. And it can do like 240 or something at like 720p or something like that. It's got a really nice lens. I'll give it that. No, no distortion or anything like that. So the lens is where this thing really shines. Mm -hmm. um, it's got good audio. So you can record audio out of the box. You don't need a microphone or anything. You, you can yeah. put one on it, though. Is that the newer one with the with the three and a half mil plug on it? Yes. Yeah. OK, Mine, mine's a uh, I think the four, the series four. Yeah, we have yeah. to buy the adapter or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The, this one, this one, you can go right. Yours is a seven. Side. Yeah, the seven yeah. It, goes, it goes right there. That's super nice one. So, yeah. so this is a fantastic camera. Really, it's it's all metal. It's very heavy. It's battery life's kind of janky. But here's the That's thing. That's true. This right here, 
has a similar sensor. They both use a Sony sensor. This mm. obviously doesn't have a zooming lens, right? So when you factor that, if you need to zoom, like if zoom is a part of your workflow, then you're going to want the other camera. But this kicks its ass in every other department for $399 because it's yeah. got the similar Sony sensor, but it does 5K or 4K at 60 or 1080 That's at 240 good. with That's HDR, awesome. with high dynamic range. This can't even do high dynamic so, range. So you use you use the the hint or the cyber shot for your main footage. You use the GoPro for B roll. Yep. Like you yep. you want that cool slow mo shot where you where you scrub past like this. You do a 1080 because you're probably so you record at 4K. You're probably yep. going to downscale it to 1080 to upload to YouTube anyway. So you're going to take that 1080 240 FPS. That's going to be nice and smooth and nice kind of a slow mo thing. You ah, uh, it's great. They're awesome. They're, Whoa. They're absolutely awesome. Whoa, a project Wait, red happened? team. Hey, it was a hundred dollars. Holy cow. Who who is Project Red Team? Who are these guys? Wait, I thought Red is Red Team is an AM. Like is that red, an AMD thing? Is that Red Camera? Who who are you? Yeah, R, Project R3D. Red team. Project R3D. It's time to take the next leap in reliability and functionality. But first, you're you're saying, hey Jerry, did you get a chance to play with the rail core yet? That sounds like a gun. I haven't when, fired it up, but I've played I've played it, it's I haven't printed on it yet, but I have actually like plugged it in and farted around with it a bit. Yeah. When you're done playing with that, we need to get you a Daedalus. It takes the old RC design to a whole new level. Ooh. Whoa. So so a rail core printer. So so I'm guessing Project Red Team, you guys are the ones that make the it's that, a 3D that make printer. Rail core? Yeah. So so yeah. rail cores are a really weird breakout 3D printer. So they're they're not like a conventional Cartesian printer that just uses uh one belt on the z-axis and one belt on the y-axis. Like the way they route the belts is really, really weird. And the motors work together to move the print head. So it's actually really fast. Yeah, it's like it looks like it's it's like two. Yeah, like if you move it on any axis, it turns both stepper motors. So, so, the, yeah. so it's doing some math to merge cool. them together. But what it does is it allows the acceleration on them to be like insanely fast. Like they can print faster than any other printer. Um, the other thing they're really good for is because they use actual linear uh, rails to slide around the carriage, which have no slop in them. Whereas like a screw drive or a belt drive mm. is going to have a little slop in it. These have no slop yeah. in them. They're like perfect geometry. They use them on like giant CNC machines and stuff. So they're very expensive. And it drives up the cost of the printer. But what it does is it allows it to get down to an accuracy where, like, in theory, you can print it 10 micron. Like, you can literally have Whoa, each layer be, micron. like, the That's thickness cool. of a human hair. And it would take for, you know, it'd take a while to print it, obviously. But it can do it. Whereas a conventional 3D printer would just sit there and mash into it and rip it off the build plate. <laughs> so so they're actually really, really, really cool. You said we made what? the, oh, you made the rail core kit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I've now we make their, the Daedalus. Their, I've heard, I've heard of the Daedalus. I don't know if I've seen it. Do you guys? Do you guys have? Well, here, let me go to your website. Isn't that website. isn't that a spaceship from Stargate? It is actually. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. No, All kidding. right. So the Daedalus. I'm gonna have to take a look at this thing. Do you guys got it on your? Oh yeah, right here. I Here's do. The Daedalus. So the Daedalus looks very similar to a rail core. Looks a little bigger. I think they may. I think they have like a. Is this a side by side? Of, I don't know. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out like what the what the fundamental it's difference just is. Better. It's just better. It's just, it's just better. Oh well, I clicked on it, and unfortunately, no graphics are loading or anything. So I'll have to check this out a little later. It's doing some weird stuff. Yeah, no, I'll definitely oh. check this out. It looks. I mean, they, it looks like they changed the geometry, so now the linear rails are inside of the cabinet. They're not running along the top of the cabinet, so that's cool. But no, I'll, I'll definitely check this out. No, the reason that I wanted the rail core. So, which a matter of fact, by the way, this actually brings up a good point. I still need to get you the Ultimaker, dude. So oh. whenever, whenever you're ready to start 3D printing, I have an Ultimaker 2 ready for you. Like, oh, good shit. So, okay. so because uh, basically I picked up the rail core from, from Kevlar Condom. Uh -huh. And because the rail core is a much more complicated printer. Like, okay. like you get it like dialed in and everything, but it's a higher capability printer. The Ultimaker is just set it and forget it. You flip the thing on, you put right. some filament, it'll print anything you ask it to. Yeah. Um. So, so it doesn't require any like special slicers or third party software or tuning. It's just out of the box. It just works. Cool. Uh, so I figured that that would be a better 3D printer for you. Sure, and I already sure. have a bunch of ulti makers, so I was I like, just, I'm going to diversify my makerspace. I got to think about what what to make. Part of me is like, dude, I want to get into D and D minis. Ooh, for for D and D uh, minis, honestly, te technically a rail core can do it. I saw a rail core printing insanely tiny stuff, but I would go for an SLA resin printer. I was that. yeah, I was I was talking with Joel about it, and he's like, dude, you'd, you'd get the um, oh crap, I can't remember now, but it's like a three three or four hundred dollar is it the elegant like mars a, it's got like a 4k screen thing on it um 
dag nabbit. Because there's, a, there's he's a like, couple dude, of get, SLA printers he's like, that get are the, cheap now. Get the yeah, he's like, get that resin printer. It's it's small, but um like, he'd is, be like he'd be like it's it's perfect for it. Um where's my Budacles print? I I've showed you that before, right? The, the resin Budacles. oh blast. The, the clear resin one. Please. Did you like, oh, shit on my desk? Let please. me see. Uh, not the any cubic, no. Because the two I know are the any cubic futon and the Elegoo Mars are the ones that like all my friends and stuff. Seem maybe to buy. maybe it was the Elegoo one. I know I'd I'd recognize it as soon as I see it. The thing is, it's gotten way cheap. Like res resin printer Dude, used to be way cheap. expensive, and now you can get a liter of resin for like thirty bucks on the low end, like thirty or forty dollars, which it used to be like one hundred and fifty dollars if you bought it from like Form Labs back in the day. Yeah. So um. So yeah, no. What I what I would do if you're printing miniatures is definitely go with a resin. Yeah, because there's a couple things a resins can do that an FDM can't do. One is they they print at insanely high resolution with insanely high accuracy. You can print with uh, almost you, you need almost no stuff. surface finish. You yeah. know, for like small things, like if you're doing like injection molding stuff. The thing is, is, like SLA is good for things that you don't need insanely high strength. Like an SLA yeah. on the high end of material is like a, a FDM on the low end of material spectrum. So if you need to make really strong parts or large parts, SLA be, doesn't scale very well. But, okay. uh, so that's why I think everybody should have both. Like me, I have a form lab yeah, too that uses laser laser SLA. This isn't quite the Elugu is similar, but this isn't the one that Joel was. Oh, is it a Piopoli? Piopoli phenom? Um, so James Hardwood, thank you for the two dollar super chat. Dude, there's a bunch remember. of them that, because the thing is, they're so simple. Like here, here's what's this is what cracks me up. So you have basically what it comes down to is the resin. The reason the SLA got cheap is because of the resin, because yeah. Form Labs, when they came out, I, I have their form too. back back when it was like forty eight hundred dollars or five thousand dollars. Form gave me one of their their uh, SLA 3D printers that uses laser laser uh, lithography. Mm -hmm. And the resin's like a hundred to a hundred. I think it goes from a hundred for a liter up to 250 a liter, depending on the type of material. And it has to be cured with a pretty intense laser. It's like, it's like a one watt ultraviolet laser or whatever that has to hit the stuff, but it makes the resin super expensive. The resin that reacts to it is super yeah. expensive. They figured out how to make resin now that just reacts because you have to have a, or sorry, not the resin's expensive. The laser is expensive and it's slow. So then somebody figured out, wait a second, why don't we just create a resin that just cures from the from LED light coming, com, you know, contacting it, basically just light. Right. And so they create these LED screens, you know, just like you'd watch your TV on. You put that up under the vat and it cures each layer with the light from the screen. So all, all the all it is, all you need to make an SLA 3D printer. I've even seen people do this like homebrew mm -hmm. is you just need a Z axis that lifts a metal plate. And you need right. an acrylic box that can hold resin that's clear on the bottom and a screen on the bottom of the acrylic box. That's it. That's literally, that's why they're so cheap. That's why you can find them for like $250, $300. The reason form printers are so expensive is because the form printers are using uh, like wicked formulated resins that are designed for very, very specific things. Like you can actually get a resin that's wax. Like, like, I don't know if you can get a wax resin for a, uh, for like a regular D like a DLP or a screen based yeah. SLA printer. But, but yeah, their materials are really expensive because the formulation and the laser curing can, uh, cure a broader range of resins. Whereas you have to use very specific resins to cure them with a screen. It might've been the frozen one, but I'm, I'm, none of these are really sparking a bell here. So I'll have to talk to Joel again about yeah, it. Sushi boy said Joel, Joel loves the phenom. And I seen his video where he talked about the phenom and printed it, some stuff on it. It prints really may have well. been that one. I don't know. I, I don't recall, but <clears throat> they all seem to work good now. That's the thing is like, they're so simple. It's hard for them to suck. Yeah, here. So if there's been a couple mentions, hero forge, those guys are expensive. Like, I know like you can design, like they have like a designer thing. You can make your little model and stuff. And yep. like, I guess they'll give you a, uh what is it like an obj or something a, a model file yeah. for it but last i looked into hero forge it was cost prohibitive <laughs> yeah no, no and that's the thing is there's such a wide gamut right from the professional market like if you want a large build volume sla printer the amount yeah. of resin that you have to use goes up exponentially because even if you're not printing with that resin you still need the vat to be filled to a certain depth and so so everything goes up like exponentially when you're doing that with the filament printer. You don't right with if you're printing something bigger, you don't have to have a vat that has the volume of all this fluid to be able to print it. 
And so, so there's different, different printers for different jobs. And that's why I try to have so many different 3d printers. It's like, I can tell you what every one of my 3d printers is good at. They all have their thing that they're good at. Right. So I have a belt 3d printer that I, that I haven't reviewed yet, but a belt 3d printer, what it can do is just repeat a print over and over and over again and dump them off into a box or it's yeah. called infinite Z. If I want to print a pole that's 10 feet long, I can do it. If I want to print an I beam that's 10 oh, feet long, are, I can do it. Yeah. Those, it's those it's a belt at a 45. Belt. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it just feeds it cool. out. So, the, so those are good for production. Like if you need to just make something over and over and over again, especially simple shapes like like brackets and stuff for shelves and stuff, you can just crank them out on that thing, right? Overnight, run yeah. it 24 seven. My other printer, if I need to print something that's on the large size, but it's an organic shape, I usually use a Delta printer. So like my right. uh, CME CNC Artemis. It's super fast. Delta printers are so much faster than Cartesian printers because all of the motors are moving simultaneously to move the head. So it's got a mechanical advantage. So so you can move this heavier print head much faster than a Cartesian printer can because you're not just slamming against a wall and going the other direction. It's a very organic and fluid movement. So, so I use that if I want to print something at like 250 millimeters a second. That's an organic shape. Now, if I want to print something that's a box or something that's like a utility shape, like let's say I want to print like a tissue box, right? Yeah. I could I could I do that on a Cartesian sure like all day long right and yeah. so so different printers for different jobs and the thing with the rail core is like what the rail core would be really good at is flawlessly dimensionally accurate things like if i want to print something with like a one millimeter nozzle and make something that's incredibly delicate but has a decent size to it and something that i don't think would be a good fit for sla uh that's what i would use that's what i use a rail core for and so that's that's where each one of those printers kind of fit into the set and then the ulti makers are kind of the they they do everything pretty good they don't do anything exceptionally well, but they do everything pretty good. They're they're not the fastest. They're not the they're not the cleanest. They they they're very reliable though. I mean, they're they're that's the thing I like about them is they don't clog very often, and they just they just run and run and run and run. I've printed sixty prints in a row off one over three months. Never nice. had a single clog. What's that? That's a nice. Yeah. So so that's why I thought an Ultimaker would be better for you because something like a rail core requires a lot more calibrating. Uh, the the setup of it to get it like yeah. set up and get the slicer and everything like that is is a, is more than what the average user is going to want to do just out of the box. But then again, mm -hmm. it's a kit, it's a precision kit printer, right? You, you when you're building it, part of building it is properly calibrating it and doing all that stuff. So it's implied that you're going to do that stuff and you care about that level of accuracy. But just out of the box, Ulti makers are great, but they're way too expensive. They're not accessible to the average person. And right. can you print the same print quality on a two hundred and ninety nine dollar uh, Z Max or whatever or Creality CR ten? Yeah, absolutely. You can. It just takes a little bit of tuning and playing with the slicer settings and figuring out your material. But yes, I've seen somebody who is really, really good at 3D printing, take the cheapest two hundred ninety nine dollar printer and produce a nice, very, very clean, <laughs> large 3D print that matched that of a, of a printer that was like four thousand dollars. Yeah. So you can do that. But I like Deltas out of, out of all the printers. The Delta is my favorite to watch because Delta printers just look like a giant robotic arm, like floating in space. It's got like three yeah. arms that come down to the carriage and all three arms are like moving up and down to like move the print head around. So it just they look badass. They look super futuristic. They make really, really cool. All 3D printers make really cool noises. Yeah. But but the Deltas just I don't know. There's something about a Delta printer that always has my heart like and, and plus Aww. they're kind of cool because the build surface the the geometry of how they move, it has a circular build plate. Whereas a Cartesian has a square build plate, the deltas have a circular build plate. So like if you want to just print like a giant cylinder for something or like a bearing yeah. or a bushing or something like that. Oh, they're perfect for that. Huh. And they're fast. They're just wicked fast. That's the other thing I like about them. Have we covered the valve story yet? No, we could probably start no. getting some topics. No, yeah, we though. haven't touched on any of our topics yet. <laughs> you, you, you might, can, can you entertain the troops while I go take a, a 41 year old man tinkle really quick sure, and then I'll be sure. right back? Yeah, yeah. And then we'll jump on into these topics. Get all up in that topic. Yeah. All right. Auxiliary, you have, you have the con, uh, sir. Uh, uh, uh. So let's see. Uh, actually, there was a question way back. Somebody was talking about like advice for uh, time lapse. Um, Honestly, I don't have a lot of video editing experience. The only thing I've ever done. Oh, yes. Yes. My space for rent is still available. Um, I I didn't put in my OBS virtual camera to to advertise it. But yes, yes, it is. It is still available. Uh, always. In fact, always available. Um, yeah. Somebody somebody I can't recall the name now, but they were asking uh, advice for time lapse. The only time lapses I've ever done. Um, Oh, it was you, Sushi Boy. Okay, cool. Um, what I did was, I so it was a build video, right? I was building a PC. It was top down, looking at the build surface. 
um, I recorded the whole thing in real time and um, I cut out all, all of the, there were times where like I walked away from the bench or wasn't, wasn't actively doing something. I cut those chunks out and then smooshed those all together into one like timeline. I'm again, not a video editor. So the vocabulary is not right. But, but if you, when you cut out the chunks in premiere pro, they, they're, they're separate like sections, right? You want to smoosh them all into one line. And I just sped it up like 10,000 times. And, and then, um, and so like, it was like two hours or three hours worth of, of stuff. And I was trying to squish it down into like two minutes. And, um, so, and Premiere Pro would only let me speed it up like 10,000 times, which is not enough. So I exported that as a, as a video file, MP4 or whatever, brought that back into a new Premiere project and sped that up 10,000 times. <laughs> and, and it's just, honestly, what's happening there is it's just skipping a bunch of frames. Um, so th- I'm sure there's a better way to do it. Honest. I'm sure of it. Um Heck, some cameras even have time lapse features where they'll take where they take it's basically they take one picture every half second or something or whatever you can change the delay. Um, that's an option. So it's it's going to be a combination, I think, of of how you record the footage and then how you edit the footage as well. So, but that's that's again not. I'm sure that that's not the best way to do it. But that's how I did it. <laughs> Man, can I put mask? Is it Stop looking at my ass. I can't help it. My uh, air conditioner went AWOL. Uh-huh. I was wondering why I'm like feeling like so tired and more drowsy than usual. It's like 80 degrees in here. I didn't even notice. Oh, geez. Yeah, I gotta see if the compressor kicks there's, on. There's sunglasses. Here are sunglasses. I'm poking around in this Hero Forge thing. So I in uh I when I played EverQuest 2 for quite a while, it was that was actually one that I played quite a bit. Um they have a, a rat race, like you're like a, a mouse person, right? Um and as I was going through the you know facial features and stuff, I found that they had these big round sunglasses round lens sunglasses like three blind mice style and i was like boop that's it i made an assassin so it's like a rogue offshoot uh and i named my character blindy o sightless <laughs> <laughs> and, and it has been my most favorite character i've ever played is oh wow so hero forge you can literally just like make your own character uh, they have like a bunch of bits and pieces that you can like kind of customize your little mini but it's like $8. They'll send you an STL file. So I'm like, well, fuck. What a great idea. Yeah. This is, it's, it's almost like when you go to like Thingiverse or something, there's like a parametric model where you can like change the settings or whatever and get the STL. I mean, that's worth paying a couple bucks for. Dude, for eight bucks. Yeah. yeah. Like, that's not bad at all. My question is, do you, if they send you the STL for the $8, do you actually own the rights to that creation? Or like, are, are, could you take that creation and then sell it yourself? Or That's a good question. is it for personal use? Because if, because if for like eight bucks, you can buy something and then like start create your whole set of characters for your own D&D game or something like that and sell them on like, uh, on, uh, you know, what Etsy or whatever. That'd be kind of cool. People could yeah. totally make a living yeah. off that, you know, from the people that don't, they're not really good at like, you know, putting stuff together and right. making stuff they like. Print it out and paint it. And then sell it. Seth said, why aren't you over streaming on Twitch, switching to YouTube for good? No, I stream on Twitch three times a week and I stream on YouTube one time a week. It's been that way for a year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, this is this different content. Yeah. Over here, we talk tech and over here, you got auxiliary to look at. And over on Twitch, I just spend hours and hours and hours bitching about controversial stuff and getting a bunch of people triggered. Stuff. So, so pick your poison. <laughs> this is my, this is my chill stream. Um, I, I never even heard of that Hero Forge thing. That's pretty damn cool. I mean, it's I'll, been I'll around for quite that. a while. They used to be wicked expensive. Like it would be like thirty five dollars for a mini. Oh damn! Um, but that was years ago. I'm I'm shocked to see, dude. Even to have them printed out for you, like grayscale, just gray plastic, is yeah, twenty sure bucks. Twenty bucks for that's, a that's for a standard 
30 millimeter or 30 millimeter scale, like your, your standard D and D scale, yeah. mini, an inch, one inch base, 30 millimeter scale, 20 bucks. It's, it's, I mean, that's it's about print, what you'd pay hey, for, a, for, you know, he, um, what is it? Whiz kids. Yeah. Whiz kids makes minis. If so. they're printing on an SLA printer though, that, that cost is somewhat justified. Like if I printed that and sold it on my shop, I would have to sell it for probably 25 or 30 bucks. Yeah. To make a profit. So, so I do understand, but the thing is, if you're going to buy a bunch of them, you just think up front, right? If, if you're going to buy, uh, they're, they're 20 bucks and you're going to buy 10 of them, just go buy the printer at that point. Like just buy the printer right. and then do your own. Cause in the end, it'll be cheaper in the long run. Yeah. And you're going to get that quality too. That's the other thing is a lot of people are like, Oh, if I have it professionally printed though, the quality is going to be so much better. Not necessarily. Yeah. Not necessarily. Like unless you're buying something that's insanely expensive from Shapeways that's using like, um, like, like an SLS, like stereo lithography or stereo, sorry, st what is it? Sintering, laser sintering, selective, no, laser sintering, some shit like that. I forget what SLS stands for, but something like Shapeways where they're using like a million dollar machine that's literally melting metal dust together to make like a titanium ornament or something. Oh yeah. Then that's something you're not going to be able to do at home. Like that, honestly, you're not going to, but if you're just printing stuff in like plastic, like even if you want to cast stuff, like I watch all kinds of YouTubers and, I, and I've been wanting to do this myself for the longest time because there's one of my one of my most popular videos I ever did on YouTube was showing people how to create a forge. Mm -hmm. And so we created this this forge out of just a bucket and some, you know, refactory cement <laughs> and we melted and made ingots. Right. We made aluminum ingots. Yeah. And what I wanted to do that we never got to got around to try was taking some green sand, which is sand that, you know, binds mm -hmm. together under pressure. It's like le yeah, the Lego yeah. of sand. And it can handle really high temperatures. And what you do is you just 3D print whatever you want, do a little post-processing on it if you need, you know, like clean up the support and sand it down. And then uh, you basically just stick the thing into the sand. You pack it all in there. You put your finger in to make a little hole down to where it is. And you just dump the metal in there. And what it does is it just vaporizes PLA. Whoa. You don't even need wax. Like PLA literally vaporizes and off gases. So it's called last lost PLA, just like lost okay. wax, lost PLA casting. And I've seen really cool videos online where these guys master it and they can print out like entire car parts and shit just from stuff wow. they printed on a multi maker. That's neat. Yeah, I saw a video of a dude that made a throttle body. He literally 3D printed a throttle body for like a 1918 Ford pickup or something like that. And he 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 printed out the part. He finished it with like sandpaper and some hand files. And then yeah. he took it in the sand. He dumped it in there. He poured the casting. He took it off. He cut all the flashing off with like a little uh, like hand file. Yeah. And and when he was done, he just stuck it on the truck and like ran the parts into it. And I think he honed some of the holes out. Some of the holes were a little rough. So he took in like a drill bit and went through the holes to hold like the butterfly valve and everything. And it worked. It worked. He put <laughs> on the truck and fired up, man. He like literally brought it back to life and made like an OEM part. I was like, dude, that is the coolest shit ever. Wow. As that a matter of fact, there's cool. a, they're, they're in India. There's a guy in India that has a YouTube channel. I can't remember the name of it, though, because he doesn't speak a lick of English. But I clicked on it one day because I saw a thumbnail of a dude literally just like sitting out in a yard with like a bunch of sand, just a pile of sand. Yeah. And he had uh, a bunch of 3D prints that were sitting there and a bunch. Of, oh, sorry. No, it wasn't 3D prints. It was old parts. It was like old parts off cars. And what huh. he was taking is taking the old parts on cars, taking them apart, sticking them in the pile of sand. He packs a bunch of sand around. He doesn't even use a box or anything. He packs a bunch of sand around, puts his finger in and like sticks it in a pit. And then his buddy just pours molten metal into it. And then they put it in a little cooling pile. He hits it on the ground. It opens up. And then his little dude's over there with like a file taking the flashing off. It. And he's like making replacement parts for like old cars literally like wow. in the back like in the street like literally in the street with just a pile of sand a fire and some molten metal i was That's like Dude, this is the cool. coolest thing ever so if that guy can do it then anybody can do it yeah yeah for sure i mean obviously he's really good at what he does because he can do it really really fast but i'm just saying like he didn't need any special parts like this dude didn't have any special machines he didn't have any kind of like electric forge he was literally just like creating a fire pit and putting a crucible in it and filling it with, I don't know, maybe he was making the parts out of like zinc or something. Cause it was, yeah. he was literally melting it with like a, a hot campfire. And I was like, dude, this is the coolest shit ever. This dude's just doing this out in the street. He had like no shoes on was wearing like shorts. <laughs> like, it was like, it, it's, it's so surreal to watch, watch that stuff go down. It's like literally he was doing it like they did back in the bronze age. And I'm Neat. like, dude, that's badass. So you can do that with 3d printers though. Just look up a uh, lost PLA casting on okay. YouTube and you will find a million people that are literally, you just, PLA, the cheapest material there is like, I, I can't think of any cheaper material than PLA. It's literally uh, a, a by It's like corn. It's processed corn. That's what they make PLA out of. Oh, it's, sure. it's human safe. You could literally eat it. It's not recommended, but you could. It's not going to poison you, <laughs> um, but you but it vaporizes when you get it to the temperature of metal. 
So like even okay. a cool metal, like I think you can even do aluminum, like aluminum will even work. Aluminum has a really low melting temperature. I think it's like 1200 or something degrees. Yeah. So, so you just print your thing, right? You, and you can even print it with the spout on it too, if you want, or you just stick a little piece of, you know, filament in there and make the hole for the stuff to pour in. And then yeah. you put a vent hole at the bottom so that, you know, the stuff can come back out on the bottom and let the air out while you're pour, pulling it in. But as you're pouring it, you just see steam blowing out. And that's the, that's the PLA just disintegrating. Oh, and it gets replaced with metal and it keeps the detail in everything. Like if you, if you do a good job prepping your mold, you end up with like this, probably you destroy the piece every time, right? To turn the plastic into cool. the metal. It's a one shot. System, that's, so that's part of the, uh, that's yeah. I mean, that's just like how they do, um, you know, they'll do like, like wax molds for rings and stuff. You carve yeah. out, you carve out the design in wax, you put the clay around it and stuff, and then you pour hot metal into it and it melts the wax away. And now you have your metal piece. So it's, similar sort of process it sounds like yeah but a uh, buddy of mine uh i, I don't want to say who it is because they're kind of sensitive about this it's a it's a business deal they have mm -hmm. but they have a company that's a it's a government contractor that makes uh the couplers for water pipes like water mains oh yeah so, so where the pipes come together for the water main there's like a there's a junction that goes on there that basically redirects the water into smaller pipes so it's basically yeah. like a collet that goes around the big pipe and then it creates like a little offshoot for a smaller pipe okay. and there's a company that he bid for the rights to build the castings. And so what he does is he takes desktop 3D printers that are that you could buy, like big, big build volume ones, like um, like a, a Z Max, you know, like, okay. like that size printer. And, it, and he has to print it in eight chunks. So he prints these valves in eight chunks, eight segments. Yeah. And then he puts them together and he bonds them together with this, this binding agent that basically has the same uh, like flash point to burn off as the PLA. Mm -hmm. And he puts them together. When he's done, he basically has like these like 15 or 20 pound solid plastic castings that, are, that, that he then sells to this company. And the company buys them off him for like insane amounts of money. Like he makes like probably 30 times more than he puts in material wise and time wise awesome. for these things. And, and they think it's a deal because for them to pay a company to make those castings for them, they yeah. charge them way more than that. So he just runs his printers 24 seven, cranking out these pipe fittings. And, the, and he has a contract where they'll buy as many as he can print. And so everyone he prints is just cha-ching, cha-ching. He prints eight parts. He he glues them together. And then once they set, he throws them in a box and ships them off. Huh. And he gets a paycheck. And I'm like, dude, this is the coolest thing ever. But it's because he is actually cheaper to do it that way than the cheapest company that bid after him that, like, professionally makes, like, the castings for those things. Yeah. For lost lost casting. Like, like if you wanted to build an engine for a car, right, the way they do that is they have a machine that basically, like, you know, fills a fills a thing with wax. And then the wax goes over into the sand or whatever. Then the sand fits around it or whatever. Then they pour the shit in and it burns it out. And then you get a motor block, right? right. So he's basically doing that insert. Wow. And, and it's so it's so cool. Like, I was like, yeah, I wouldn't have thought that anybody with just like a desktop 3D printer at home could like outbid like, you know, professional contractors and stuff. But no, you absolutely can. So just just keep, keep an eye out. Like, like if you think that it, it that, this is the thing, you got to think outside the box. You got to think about the things that everybody else is like, nah, that ain't going to work. Yeah. Like actually yeah. one of my biggest mistakes that I think I've ever made in my life was I had an idea like probably, geez, it's gotta be like 15, 20 years ago. I was doing some soldering and I was like, you know, it'd be cool because I was also doing welding. I was doing MIG welding. If, you, if you've never done MIG welding, basically the way it works is when you pull the trigger on the welder, it feeds a stick of metal out through the nozzle. And as soon as it contacts the metal, it basically just melts in your welding. So, so it's like, a, think of it like a hot glue gun, but metal coming out of it. Right. Yeah. So I was soldering one day and I was getting really fucking frustrated because as I was soldering, I was basically not able to hold everything where I wanted it while I was soldering it. Right. Because I didn't have like a nice setup, you know, where you could do that. And I didn't have like a desoldering gun and all that stuff. I was getting really frustrated with welding. I was like, dude, why don't they make a soldering iron that feeds a stick of solder through the hot end? So that when you're soldering, you just put the sharp little tip down on whatever you want to solder. You push the button. It just squirts out a little liquid solder and yeah. you just like glue the wire on there. Like that would be the coolest shit ever. Right. And I looked everywhere and I couldn't find it. It did not exist. I was like, nobody has done this. And I was like, man, I should design something like that. And like, you know, all good ideas. I was like, nah, it ain't worth it. Like, nobody's going to want one of those. Like, and, and fast forward like seven years and I see an advertisement for a German company that made exactly what I wanted. Like exactly yep. what I wanted. And the price they sell it for is insane. Like that would have been like one of those things where it's like, I never even would have had to make one. I would have just put it down on an idea, patented it. I could have even poor man to patent that thing and just sold it to a company. And it probably would have been set for life. And I was like, son of a bitch. But it's things like that. It's when you talk yourself out of stuff. Oh, yeah. That's when you don't go anywhere. Because I made excuses. I was like, oh, nobody's really going to want that. I'm probably the only guy. There's probably a better way to do this anyways. 
Um, but I, but I couldn't believe that it was like, I had an idea for something that didn't exist. And then like seven years later, of course, somebody else had the same idea and they acted on it. How many other people just like me had that same exact idea when they were frustrating soldering that also did welding? Cause that's yep. how I made the connection. I'm like, wait, wait, with welding, I can just take two pieces of metal and pull a trigger and go, you know, and build a bead of like, why can't I do that with solder? It's metal. Like, why? And so it just blew my mind when that came out. My buddy sent it to me. I didn't find it. Like my buddy that knew my idea that I told it to like seven years later, he sends me a link. He's like, dude, you're never going to guess what I found. And I was like, no. And then it was too expensive for me to buy. So I never, never actually got one. Hey, the Canadian barbarian. Thank you. The five Canadian dollars. He said hero forge is printed by Shapeways, and they print in color. They can, yeah. Wait, wait, hold, wait. See, so twenty bucks, and they're printed by Shapeways. They must have some stellar no, deal going with Shapeways. Twenty dollars is for the just gray, like. like but still, plain Shapeways is like okay. Shapeways must have changed because back when I was when I did the tour of Shapeways factory and I asked them how much it cost to print like various things, it was insane. Yeah. They must have brought their prices down because like even for plastic three D printing, it was like literally several hundred dollars to get like a one off. Let's see for. Yeah, for, for plastic figures are primed with gray primer and have some layer lines. They're manufactured with 100 micron layer resolution, 30 millimeter scale, blah, 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 20 bucks. You go up higher, glossy black, some faint layer lines, similar durability to regular plastic manufactured with 50 micron layer resolution, double oh. that or base. Those are 30. So the first one's FDM. That's why they're selling them so cheap. They're basically and just then, sending you a print off an FDM. If you want color plastic figures are a coated 3D printed color plastic material. Those are 45 you can do bronze for a hundred and then eight bucks for the STL or you can get, you can actually get the 3d model, a unity 3d format for eight bucks too, for a tabletop simulator stuff. That's cool. And more, you can do steel for 35 nylon for 60. B said Barnweller has made a solder feeder for several decades. Well, I sure as fuck couldn't find it. And I searched, I searched for it for a long time. That was something that I genuinely wanted to own for a very, very long time. Huh. So, so if they came up with it, like obviously they don't own the rights to it because another company created it like seven years after yeah. I looked for this, and, and that one was actually something I could find. So, I don't know if it's the same context, uh, the same exact thing though. Like, I, I, I'd have to go look and see what it is, like a solder feeder. I'm talking about something that actually feeds the the metal down through the nozzle, not something that's just feeding the material like down towards the nozzle from the top. I'm talking about something that's like actually feeding it down through through the hot end and actually extruding it as liquid. Hmm. That'd be neat. So ba basically a hot glue gun, but uh, for solder. Because I think that that'd be so cool, dude, because then like when you're doing these little projects and stuff, you don't have to hold solder and the part and the little iron or have a thing holding the part. You literally just hold the part and just be like, bloop, 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 bloop. And you could like adjust it to just have a little tiny bit come out, like that tiny little micro droplet, like each time you hit the button. So you're just like, when you're doing really finicky stuff, just put that little needle down there, tiny little thing, and be like, doot, 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 let a little through. And then when you're done, you know, have a mechanism where it just heats up really hot and then it blows blows air through it or something to like clear the nozzle. That would have been awesome. That would have been All so right. awesome. So crypto collectibles. Crypto collectibles. So this is, uh, this is physically owning something that doesn't exist. So I guess sort of. So not, it's still, I think... I think it's so it's 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 still a digital product correct okay so you're not it's not like you know a painting or a or a sports card these are still these are still digital they exist like photographs or something yeah imagine something that can't be duplicated is uh what's the name is it Be beepo b beeple beeple the Beeple is the person that I just learned about, like within the last two weeks, I learned about this. And uh, Beeple, if, if you should go follow him on Twitter. He's awesome. So Beeple just makes like the craziest, most weird, like crazy art. Like the dude makes a picture every day. Like his claim to fame is he's made a picture like every day for like, I don't know, 5,000 days or something like that. Uninterrupted, never missed a day. And it's all like 3D rendered stuff. It's like he, he makes these 3D, but, but here's what makes his stuff like really, really cool is that he sells it as digital art in these digital collections mm -hmm. where he basically sells you one of a certain number of prints. And these prints are actually encoded into a blockchain, usually Ethereum. So, so what that means is yes, you could take the picture and technically copy it. You could copy the picture, but you'd never be able to prove that you're the actual owner of that. Right. right. If it was copied, if it was just an image posted to the internet, it'd be really hard to determine who really owns that image once it's flooded around the internet. The concept here is that the original, the print, 
that the mm -hmm. artist is selling you is encoded into the Ethereum blockchain, which means they actually spent Ethereum to yeah. put it into the blockchain, and now they're transferring that to you. From, and, go ahead. from what I understand, it's it's like an authentication Correct. sort of thing. Yeah. So like it, the way I, I heard it kind of like the example was like the, the blockchain is saying that this is an authentic original. Correct. Like this is the original digital production like it's not it's not a copy because you can you can go and match like one of the examples is um the the original person who made the nian nian cat like image yep. they sold that on on the or uh, as authenticated by the blockchain for 300k or something like that yeah and so, it, it has and value mean, it's everywhere right but the original file or or whatever is authenticated via blockchain and so you know that that is the that's one the number one the original like production of it and that's pretty freaking cool i be like damn man yeah there's a whole scene for this now it's called crypto art yeah and there's and there's a couple different sites that curate it and the idea being is yeah if you want you could copy it make it the background on your computer print it out and hang it on your wall but you don't ever own it Mm -hmm. Like, if you want to be the person that owns that, like, that is literally a possession, like your car parked in your garage. It's like you can own a one of one Ferrari and some dude can go create a knockoff of it. But yours is the one of one. You can go back to the records at Ferrari and prove that that is your car and you bought it and it all links back to you. Well, yeah. with digital art online, it's really hard to do that because a digital artist might sell their art on Etsy. One person buys it and then another person just resells the shit out of it and copies it and just sells a bunch of counterfeits. So it's this called is, NFTs. Yes. Yeah. So this is so this fungible tokens. Yes. Fair enough. Fair enough. So so the idea being here is that the blockchain can also store data. So yeah. so that's in that most. Well, I don't think the Bitcoin blockchain can, but Ethereum and a lot of other blockchains that support smart contracts allow you to store it. And many of the cryptocurrencies even allow you to connect it to a file system. I can't remember what it's called, like IPFS or something like that, where the cryptocurrency blockchain also corresponds with a BitTorrent like network of file sharing where people replicate the files across the network and then link them back to the blockchain. So the idea being is if you create something that's copyright that you own, that you want to physically sell to somebody and you want to be able to always be able to authentically, even in a court of law or anybody without a doubt, prove that you are the one that, that owns that. That is your art and make it 100 percent transferable, meaning that you can physically sell that asset without retaining a copy of it or having any ownership to it whatsoever. You do that through the blockchain. Yep. And this is first now that now art is the first thing that I've seen this like really heavily applied to because art is one of those things where it's like people like to be able to authenticate their art. Like if somebody right. comes over and you have a big print on your wall or you have, you know, your, your crypto gallery where you're looking through all your artwork and it can be videos too. It doesn't have to, it can be video artwork. It can be, uh, you know, a picture. It can be a 3d model. It can be anything, but basically what happens is you go sell this on an auction and if somebody bids for it, they physically buy it. And then if somebody else wants to own that and have it in their collection, they just like with like a CSGO, CSGO skins or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah, that was, it, that was thinking about that. Exactly, you gotta buy it, right? You have to physically buy it because you have a copy and somebody comes over and goes, oh man, that's just a copy. That's not the real movie, dude. It says Memorex on the CD. It's like you can prove that you own it. And then because you own it and only one person can own that particular print at that time, like however many prints they are, 101, 201, they're all, they're all numbered you have that you can put that up on an auction and resell it later on for even higher value because this stuff just like cryptocurrency is gaining value so is the artwork so mm -hmm. people was i think he sold like what was it like six it million a, dollars or something it was a, yeah it was like a collection of a thousand of his yeah. of his daily images for i thought it was a million but it might have been I, a million I, maybe I, it was a million I'm not dollars. entirely sure but there's there's all kinds of there's all kinds of like i guess this, is a, this has been a thing for a while but yeah. it's only just now blowing up because people got a fat stack out of it. And so now people are looking into it like a lot more. And this is kind of cool. Like, I mean, I looked on one of the sites and you can buy art for like 20, 30, 40 bucks. Like not all of it's like crazy, crazy money. This just hit me because I was talking with Joel a couple of weeks ago about like, what, how do you, how do you keep someone from stealing your 3d objects? Right. If I buy an STL file from you, what's to keep me from reselling it? Yeah. Right. Um, and he goes, well, you can't like, don't publicize it. Like if you put it out there, even if you sell it, there's, and there's like some ways of like, you know, trying to digitally sign the files and things like that. But, but really what it comes down to is once you've sold that file to somebody, they can do whatever they want with it mm -hmm. legal or not. This would be, I feel like this could be a way of 
of securing your 3D file. Like you sold it to somebody, but then if they if they do start copying it and selling it, you can say no, 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 no. This is mine, and here's the here's the here's the NFT to prove it. Yep. And 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 if you copied it, you can say that's not an original file. That's you copied that from me. You know. Yeah, it's like there's no way for you. You don't have to. You don't have to sit there and go, "Oh, look, I 3D modeled on my computer, and here's a video of me doing it. Here's a timestamp with a clock behind me." And they're like, "Well, I don't know. This could all be faked." It's like, no, you can't fake that. Like once You'd the artwork the blockchain is authenticated, yeah, authentic. I have the original, and here's mm-hmm. the proof. And you are now violating copyright of my original thing. Yeah. And you, you just have, need to, ver- you just need to make sure it's in the blockchain before you distribute it. Like, before right. it goes out to anybody, anybody sees it, you need to, to make sure it's authenticated. in the blockchain. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, that's fucking cool. Good luck enforcing that. It's not secure. It's public. But you can't alter the blockchain, right? No. Like, once once it's, once it's been authenticated, it's 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 there. I, again, and, and I'll fully admit, I do not understand the the fundamental aspect of of blockchain technology basically what you'd be storing is the checksum the digital fingerprint of the original artwork and the timestamp at which it entered the blockchain and then that would be universally replicated to all the other members and nodes of the blockchain and as long as 51 percent of the network agrees that that's the original blockchain it can't be altered and even if they didn't want to they'd have to fork it right it'd fork off somewhere else so you'd always own it in some blockchain and so yeah. And because it's all time stamped and it's and it's agreed to by literally millions of computers around the world that no one person has jurisdiction over, it so, gives you a lot of credibility. Like as a matter of fact, put it this way, Verisign trusts the blockchain. Sure. Verisign actually uses the uses certain blockchains to back up the uh the hashes for yeah. some of some of their crypto keys, just just on the off chance that they lose like three of their data centers or whatever, they still have something that would show that those tokens can be trusted. Right. So he's saying like you can't you can't alter the blockchain, but you also can't prevent people from accessing these files. It's not about access. It's about knowing that you've made a copy yeah. of my copyrighted product and and I can prove it because the original is authenticated with the blockchain. Well, actually, I have a good example. I have a good example that, that'll make this very simple to understand. Okay. Say so you walk into the Louvre, okay? Mm -hmm. And there's, and there's, you know, Mike, you know, a Leonardo da Vinci sketch or something's hanging on the wall, right? So you can go in there, you can take a picture of it. You can sit down there and draw a duplicate. You can counterfeit it. You can print it. You can try to sell that to other people, but they're going to want a certificate of authenticity. They're going to want to know that that is the real OG first and only thing that ever existed. They're going to want to know that what they own is authentic, authentic. And it's the thing that was touched by the original artist. So, so this happens in art all the time. That's why the counterfeit art isn't worth anything. Once it's decided to be counterfeit, it goes from being worth millions to like fucking whatever the paper value is to hang on your wall. Yeah. Yes, it's still cool to look at. Yes, just like a car. Like, you can go and build a Ferrari in your and garage. All the materials are available. That If you have right. enough money, you can build a factory and build a Ferrari. But it will never be an actual serial numbered Ferrari from right. the company that, that has the lineage and the racing lineage, all that shit. So that's the point. It's like, do you want the original? When it comes to art, that is all that matters. With right. artists, same thing. My grandma was an artist. So I grew up in this in this whole art bullshit. Um and I call it bullshit because like she'd literally go out and make it make a piece of art. She'd run like 50 prints and then she would destroy the plate. So she'd create a plate, run it through the press, make 50 printings of it and number each one of them, one of 52, 53, 50, sign them. And then she'd destroy the plate. And because she only made like 50 of them, she could sell them for like 500 or a thousand dollars. But if she made like a run of 500 of them because she went to like a big art festival or something, she wanted to get her name out there. If she printed 500, she'd sell them for like 20 bucks a piece. So the more right. scarce it is, if you have one that's like one of one, only one person can own that. And the blockchain will prove that you are the legal owner. And if you sell it to somebody else for a sum of money, you are transferring that ownership to them. And now they can legally prove that they have the original and it was transferred from the first owner to the second. Owner. You keep that chain of custody. And that means that they are the owner of it. And I think would wouldn't the the record of transfer also be recorded to the to the blockchain to the chain itself what's that wouldn't Sorry. the wouldn't the transaction also be recorded like if i gave you this and you then and that wouldn't that transaction also be a part of the chain if you bought it with cryptocurrency which is what most people do obviously yes yeah. it would be but you could theoretically also, just hand people a million dollars and they could just transfer it to your wallet also, wouldn't could I then 
like like you were saying your your grandma mm-hmm. 50, 50 prints destroy the the plate yeah go look her, her up leslie cavillac she has art in the bellevue art museum could i spin up my own like a a a, a coin or, or a token of some sort and say i've only made there's there's only 50 of this of this image yeah there's only 50 real ones 50 original prints yep and that's and that would be a part of the chain too there's only 50 of these available and Correct. you have to have at least one of these authenticated i don't know how it would it be a, it's a token right yeah. there's there, there's 50 there's only 50 tokens of this picture that are are that are real yep. anybody else who's got one is fake like you could you could put a, a certain limit or limited edition token as a part of yeah and the, if you tried to add more later on the blockchain would clearly show that you added more which means they wouldn't have the same value as the 50 that you added originally man so and you have to pay that's the other thing too is you actually have a tie to it because your crypto wallet and your cryptocurrency is actually buying the processing time to embed that into the blockchain as a token that's so, some major stuff like somebody had mentioned you could you could crypto I, I'm, 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 I don't, I don't have the right vocabulary. I don't understand enough of the the space to have to, to Dude, say I'm this. I'm still correctly. learning. It's pretty complicated. But could like, man, is that? I feel like that solves part of the the deep fake problem too. You could, you could theoretically blockchain your likeness. But I suppose since you're biological, your likeness would change, and so therefore your your hash would change too, or whatever, right? Like your like your biometrics are going to be a little different. So like, but it, there would be a way to to secure your likeness so that if somebody did make a deep fake of you, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be authentic. Like you could tell that they made a copy of you digitally. Well, what you'd have to do in that situation is you'd basically take the video of your likeness what basically the video that they would be deep faking or the photo they'd be deep faking you take that and you enter it into the blockchain and say that i have ownership of this this is mine and then if anybody deep fakes it down the road any cool. human could compare it to the original and the original would show in the blockchain it originated before the deep fake which means it has to be the real one well yeah like so like or i suppose like as an example so you're recording a an interview a, like on cnn right cnn would have to authenticate the interview as real like we really had you sitting here yep. and if anybody used that footage to as a part of a deep fake they it would that that then like that extra video would then be fake like you could you could say oh uh-uh, you totally used some of our footage from the cnn interview because that's like if they went on to try and authenticate the the deep fake or, or am I going too far with this? No, no, you're, you're kind of on the right track, but it wouldn't be an automatic mechanism. It would still be just like how you'd prove it in real life. The yeah, only difference is it's like, it's like remember compare. the old poor man patent where you could send yourself a letter through registered mail and then the post office would have a recorded record of you sending it. And if anybody else came up with the same idea later on, you could present yeah. that in court and say, no, I had the idea before. This is a sealed envelope that the U.S. Postal Service recorded on this date and time was my idea. And then you open it in court or whatever and you look at it and you're like, oh, you did have the idea before this guy. They can go fuck off. Yeah, right, that right. doesn't really work anymore the poor man patent is dead but but you get the idea of how the poor man patent works well the same thing here would apply if you if you had it in the blockchain it would be time stamped it would be added to your wallet which means since you control your wallet and you have the cryptographic keys basically the keys to your house everything inside of that belongs to you and you could literally go to a court of law or anything and say that i can prove 100 that i owned this before anybody else or if somebody else owned it and sold it to you, you can say that I am the legal owner of it at this time. And you could prove that with the blockchain. What? So to take this to another or I did in another way. So like your social security number is supposed to be like your identification number to the government. Correct. But but people can falsify or, or twist that or steal your identity and things like that. Why couldn't you authenticate yourself on a government blockchain like like i have you said you said it would be on your wallet if i have my own per, i i'm assigned a crypto wallet at birth just as i have been a social security number yep that's now my identification uh, i am that's how i could prove i'm me everywhere right 
That wouldn't work. Let me explain why it wouldn't work. Because the whole reason why a blockchain works is because it's decentralized, meaning that anybody at any time can bring on computers that become a part of that blockchain, basically sure. replicating it and doing the work. If it was a government blockchain and the government controlled it, then they would be able to manipulate it and go in because as long as they own all the things replicating the blockchain right, and they're the trusted could, thing, they could change it. You wouldn't want that. Or you could have another country put you, more computer power on and take control of the network away and then steal ideas well, and shit. Okay, but then you have a decentralized identification system that the government approves of. Like, yes, we will. We yeah. accept we accept the crypto ID as for everything, you can use that for your IRS codes or whatever the fuck. This is to pr to prove that you are you. The government says yes, cryptoid.com or, or I don't know exactly how they identify different blockchains from each other. Some hash, some some checksum or something like that. But like, well, it's literally just the number of computers that are trusting the same blockchain. Right. So like, so, if, if you're the only person running the blockchain, you can do anything you want to it. You 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 can fuck it up in all different ways that you want. But you're not going to be because you could literally just trim a bunch of transactions and throw them away and just drop back to like an old transaction and start over and rebuild it. But sure. it's because so many people have it and they replicate it. The second that you try to poison the blockchain, the majority of the other computers in the blockchain very quickly are going to invalidate that and kick you out. So you'd, you'd have to fuck up a bunch of the. You'd literally have to take majority control of the entire blockchain. And when you're talking about cryptocurrencies that have tens of millions of computers involved in them, you're not going to do that. Yeah. So, so. That's a reasonable idea. You could have your crypto wallet is your identification and it would be heck. I mean, not to get really weird and like new world order stuff. It could be a global because if you wanted, if you want the most security, you need the most, you need a bunch of people, right? You need the more people you have authenticating the chain, the more secure it is. So then you, you could potentially have a global identification system that is, you know, as long as as long as you, that that would be accepted everywhere. If you you lose it, you cease to exist. In a sense, well, no. But, what happens when you lose your social security number? You basically go to the government well, and they validate through a bunch of different methods that you are right. who you say you are, and they issue you a new number and and basically connect it to the old profile. Like they would still be able to do that, but there'd be a record in the blockchain that that took place. So if the original person ever resurfaced and was like somebody tried to steal my identity, they would instantly be able to say this person. They own this blockchain still exists and still controls it. So you can't be the real person. Yeah. Whoa. Whoa. But for registration of not just digital, but also physical assets, the blockchain is huge. As a matter of fact, it's happening right now. Well, I'm under NDA, can... so I can't say which company is doing it, but a rather large company is actually right now using the Ethereum blockchain to oh, store yeah. store cryptographic records of all their sign, all their signing, all their cryptographic signing they do for the entire business. Yeah. This is a company the world uses wide. They, they use the Ethereum blockchain to validate those transactions and they offer that to their customers so that there's a way for them to validate off of the blockchain. Even if even if this company completely goes out of existence and just dies off the surface of the planet, every single certificate that they ever issued will still remain valid. Yeah, because as long as that blockchain exists, the Ethereum blockchain exists and replicates, that will always survive. There's no way to remove it. It's pretty cool. Oh. Chain voting has the problem of not being anonymous. The vote will be linked to a wallet ID. Your votes are linked to a voter ID anyway. Like they're not, yeah, you're, they're, you're, not they're not totally they have voter registrations and stuff. That's, you, that's why our voter system works, is literally because every vote can absolutely be verified. It wouldn't I feel like it could still be anonymous, right? It would you could record that it would have to be it would be like a an uh, hang on, I, this is this is forming in my brain as I'm speaking. It would have to be kind of a two layered mm -hmm. system, right? You're because like when you go to vote, you verify that you are who you are, but then the the actual vote itself is anonymous. Like, and so I I feel like it would still be similar. You would authenticate that you are a registered voter, but then your vote could still be anonymous on a separate chain, right? Not if the two touch. <laughs> oh, okay. So I, I had I I wasn't thinking that correctly. Here, here, okay, so here's here's the thing with this is why blockchain is so interesting, right? The reason why it's so interesting is one, it's decentralized. Nobody controls it, so nobody has any incentive to really. I mean, other than a monetary or a fiscal incentive, and the amount of work that they would have to do in a small period of time to take over the network. It's like, I mean, this it's astronomical. It's not impossible, but it's astronomical compared to any system a government could actually create. It could still be a true false, right? Like, 
in in the same way that voting works now. I I I go I get the paper or I go to the thing and I I say yes I am here. It could register that yes, Houston with with wallet, bloody blood did vote. And there is a vote for bleh, and as long as those match up, we have the same number of anonymous votes and matched up with, yes, Houston and everybody else did vote, as long as those two numbers equaled. <laughs> so now, now, now this, 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 I talk about this all the time over my Twitch program. Okay. This is where forensics come in, right? So if you go to a site and you say that I voted, so there's a thing, and then within a reasonable amount of time, the th record that says you voted, there was also your vote cast. There is reasonable forensics that can be used to figure out by your location, your IP address, where both things were connected that did it. You could, without going through a bunch of cryptographic layers and stuff like that, it would be reasonably easy to figure out who you most likely voted for. They could do that with the paper votes as it is. No, no, that's, I, that's I, my I, point. This doesn't really I, offer any more security is what I'm saying, because no, there's, a, there's a paper trail. No, but it, I feel like it would be more secure. Not, not hmm. so much... Not so much as far as identifying the voters, but as, as far as identifying that the votes are good. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, from that perspective, yeah, I would say that it probably like would be it, infinitely more trustworthy. It would almost eliminate any ability for fraud. Yeah, because like, if any fraud happened, like, it would unbalance the system. You couldn't register dead people because their wallet has been, uh, has been authenticated as being invalid. Like, they died. Their wallet is now invalid. Any anything that comes up with with this wallet number can't be real because that person has been officially declared dead as a part of the as a part of the as a part of the chain. You the only would, problem is you'd have to have a mechanism in place where the network would agree like what mechanism determines that a person died. And since sure. it's global and decentralized, are you sure you're going to get China to come on board with that and be like, oh, because America told us this dude's dead, we're going to agree with that? Cool. Yeah, that's true. So so it does create like some interesting problems. I, I do like where, you, where your mind is as far as it being uh, a much more secure mechanism, because the one thing about blockchain is everything from its genesis is tracked. Right. So there's no there's no empty. There's no paper trail that gets lost. It's not like like it, it, if you create a coin or a token in the blockchain, the genesis is what they call it. Right. The, the, the yeah. genesis when that coin comes online or that token comes online, that is the first record of it. That that token throughout its entire life cycle, every single transfer, everything it's involved in, everything going in, everything coming out, all of that, all the way back to the genesis of that thing is tracked. And you have to do that because if you remove one entry in that entire chain of custody, it breaks the whole algorithm. It doesn't right. work. So, yeah, whole, so right. So, so yeah. And, and so so literally, like the more entries that you have in it, you could argue the more secure it is with less people validating the network. Just because there's so many more entries in there and they're all interconnected. If you flip any one of them out of place, move them or try to alter them, it fucks up the whole validation of the rest of the blockchain. So so you could do that. You could have a mechanism where it's like this person died. So we're going to add a record that says that this coin that came into life is now going to leave the blockchain like it's done. So this token is yeah. dead. But you yeah. would have to have the entire network agree to that. Not the entire, but the majority of the network would have to say, we agree that this guy is dead and we're going to adopt this change to the blockchain. And if a bunch cool. of them kick it out, then that guy is not dead and his assets are still in play. And I can see that being used in this ty type of fraud, like identity theft. I feel like wouldn't there be a way to verify the the claim of where we want to invalidate? I feel like there it would be like different different chains would ha would be different ways of verifying actions on. So you have one chain that verifies actions that are occurring on another. So if I say Jerry's dead on the the death chain that is that's you know everybody agrees that this chain is the is the proper record of deaths that then can be used to authentically va invalidate the wallet on another chain right see, see now now you're coming into like what they call what is it like hybrid coins where you basically have a coin that's a token generated from two other blockchains so basically the existence of something in the third blockchain is basically some connection between the first blockchain and the second blockchain. You're, you're just creating these like bigger and bigger relational blocks that say you can trust it because of this. A web of chains. Yeah. And I mean, honestly, they do that for a lot of things like this could be applied. Like, just think of it as a database that can be public. That's harder to steal from. Like, imagine if you could see everybody's bank accounts and every single bank number and everything, but you can't personally connect it to that person. Like, like, you don't know. It's literally just a number, right? It's like your social security number. If I have your social security number and I don't have access to the database that tells me what your name is, I have no idea who you are. 
Yeah. Right. So, so you have a certain amount of you're anonymous. Like until, until at one point you sell or move a piece of that crypto or move that token to somebody else who's related to you, that somebody could go and coerce into saying who transferred them that asset. And then once they know who transferred them that asset, then they can go back through the blockchain and trace every other transaction you've ever done in your entire life from that wallet. So it's basically mm-hmm. like there's a constant record of everything you do. Like, like all it takes is one piece of connecting data throughout your entire lifespan. And they can reconstruct every single thing you did with every cryptocurrency token, belonging, authentication, everything you've done in your entire life. Yeah. So and so that's I, a little scary, too. Like when you look at it that way, all it takes is you fucking up. Privacy once. part would then. Yeah, because so they took down Silk fragile. Road, dude. That's why there's like seven Silk Road. Silk Road was anonymous because it was on the Tor network, right? And yeah. the, the, you know, the drug, the under dark web drug network yeah. or whatever. And they kept getting popped for like the same reason over and over and over again. It was the way that they were transferring funds to these wallets. They kept creating anonymous wallets, like for every transaction, they'd create a new wallet. And then they'd basically launder the money between a bunch of other wallets. And yeah. it just took a, you know, one person like literally fucking up where the right. money moved from the wallet, from the Silk Road, where all the transactions went to something and they could trace that to something being shipped to another person. And they were able to create that chain of custody and go back through every single one of those little ping pong laundering things. And an algorithm was able to put it all back together and say, here is all the wallets that ever transacted and actually bought drugs that most likely received wow. drugs. So it's that that's where crypto is. It's really secure as long as you don't ever, ever touch it to personal information. The second you do it is no longer secure. Like, for instance, right now, because I have a crypto wallet with an online provider like Bittrex and Coinbase. Like if the police want, they could literally trace back everything I did with cryptocurrency, even back to when, you know, I was just starting with Bitcoin 10 years ago. They know every single thing I did, like if they wanted to, like if they were curious and they got a, you know, a warrant, they probably don't even need a warrant for that shit, honestly, because it's deregulated, but they could go through the blockchain and figure that out. Hell, somebody went through and found Elon Musk's wallet and was able to figure out every single wallet transaction that he did from his personal wallet and from Tesla. And they know what he's doing because they were able to connect it together just by looking at public information when he was saying he was doing stuff with crypto and then looking at the blockchain around that same time to see if there was any transactions that existed that were of that size at some point and then reasonably be able to figure out and narrow it down more and more and more each time he did this like on Twitter or social media and be able to figure out what the wallet is and then go back and see every single transaction he's ever done with crypto. So <laughs> so it's not like the, the whole anonymous thing. It's kind of like calling a VPN anonymous, right? A Correct. VPN is anonymous until your computer decides to send a record to Microsoft over your VPN with your real IP address saying, oh, you open Notepad EXE. Mm-hmm. Now, forensically, if you're an officer, you can go and open up that database and you can open up the VPN providers, DN- DHCP records or the logs on the service that you were connecting to through VPN and connect those two together. And it's basically like you're, you're exposed <laughs> and they can figure that stuff out. So digital forensics is like a really, really big business. However, that's not what I consider the blockchain important for. Like a lot of people like to say, oh, cryptocurrency is like completely private. No, no, unless you're unless you're running your own blockchain on your own computer through an encrypted tunnel and or sorry, not blockchain, your own wallet locally and you don't have any ties to any online businesses and you only transact in cryptocurrency and you've never taken that cryptocurrency and tried to turn it into real money. Because remember, to turn it into real money, you're going to have to sell it to somebody and for the real money and they're going to have to give you the money. So that leaves a paper trail. If you go to a bank, or an exchange and you want to transfer that exchange is going to record the record of you taking the contents of that wallet and turning it into money and send it. There's always going to be a link back, no matter how many obfuscation wallets you create, there's always going to be a link. So it's not really an anonymous thing. It's more of a security thing as far as like true ownership. Like people can't just steal your crypto unless you give them their, your wallet keys, like your private keys. They're not going to be able to take your crypto away. You have to give it to them. But once you give it to them, you're not going to get it back either. Right. It can't be a cancelable transaction. It's it's 100 percent. Everything you do in the blockchain is guaranteed. Yeah, I mean, okay, so uh, to to leave the anonym, anon, anonymity thing aside, that would be, it could still be great for, um, you know, transactions. Oh, yeah. I sell, I sell something on eBay, like, you can't just make a shitty claim and and get a refund. Like, exactly. No, I've authenticated that this is what I said it was, and... I've now, as a part of the physical item that I'm sending you, here's the authentication token. And now if you're trying to claim to eBay, oh, I, you didn't send it to me the way you said it was. Well, no, you agreed to the to accept the token as, as I displayed it to you or whatever, as I claimed it to be. That's it. You can't take it back. Or I, ca- I can accept it back if I choose, right? Yeah, you could, but then that, that would work. You wouldn't be able to force the refund. Right. It would work good for digital things, but I don't think it'd work very good for physical things because you'd be posting like a, a picture or some stats or maybe a serial number. That'd work. 
Like if you had a serial number or something that would authenticate that cool. thing as being real and you send them something that isn't real, then you yeah. would be able to compare it to that and say, this is not what the blockchain said I would be receiving. Yeah. And, and and they wouldn't be able to change that and you wouldn't be able to change it. It's almost like they would be the intermediate, like the broker, like when you broker a deal and you know both sides put their money into escrow. Mm -hmm. That's basically what you'd have in that situation is where it's like, you, you would buy the thing, you would give them the crypto, oh. but they're also giving you the token as a part of that that says that you now are the owner of it. And if you don't receive it, you can prove that you didn't receive it. There'd have to be a middleman to verify that th that the that the physical item is what the token says it is. There'd True. still have to be a middleman. Yeah. Okay. And okay. people do Man. get ripped off every day with crypto. As a matter of fact, a good friend of mine just last week messaged me and said he spent $600 on a camera. Some guy was selling on Facebook and he sent him six. You went and bought $600 worth of Bitcoin and sent it to the guy because he wanted to do Bitcoin because he doesn't do PayPal because of a bunch of crap or whatever. And ironically, as soon as he gave him the money, the guy just disappeared, stopped okay, responding right. to him and banned him off his Facebook page. And he just keeps running the scam over and over. And Facebook can't do anything about it because cryptocurrency isn't recognized to them as like a fiat currency or money. So to them, right. it's just phony money. Uh, the FBI isn't going to do anything about it. If somebody steals, like, you know, if you sent them a billion dollars of Bitcoin, even if it was under false pretenses, they're like, yeah, but by you committing to that transaction, you gave them ownership of that. There's, there's no yep. more than that. It's like you literally handed it to them. Wow. And so it'd be like you taking a bag of cash and just handing it to somebody and then going, that guy stole my bag of cash or whatever. How do you prove that cash belonged to the first guy? Right. You can't, you hand, he has it. He's the one in possession. Possession is ownership. Same thing with drugs. You can't just have a bunch of drugs and go, oh, man, I was just holding these for my friend. Right. It's like, no, you're in possession of it. And unless there is a record clearly showing in a legal fashion that can't be disputed that that was not yours, it is yours. It is on your physical person. So that's that's kind of where the, the cryptocurrency, you know, you, you have to understand the limitations of it for sure. Sure. But but it's got I mean, it's got some really cool shit. Like the, the one thing I like about it is you can't you can't block anything. Yeah. Like you can't anything like I can tell you right now for sure. In the Ethereum blockchain, I happen to know, and there's probably many more than this, there is a dick pic in the blockchain. I'm not going to say who's, whose it is, but there is there is a dick pic in the Ethereum blockchain. The whole the whole thing, like literally you could, you, it's you, you encoded. And if you find it, you can decode that. And there is a dick pic in the blockchain that can never be removed. That dick pic will still be in there in a thousand years. Unless, <laughs> unless they, you know, they, they come to an agreement where they basically trim the blockchain. You can do that over a period of time because otherwise it grows to like an unsavory size. But yeah. but yeah, no, there's a dick pic in the blockchain. But here's the other thing that sucks about crypto. And it, and again, it's something that's a you can't have your cake and eat it, too. Like you have to decide, is it going to be decentralized, which means unregulated? Mm -hmm. You are going to have bad shit. So, yes, there are movies in IPFS like copyrighted stolen movies. There is illegal pornography. There is drug transactions, money laundering, terrorism. All that shit exists, just like with cash, right? Same thing with cash yeah. Oh, yeah. going around and being traded for these things. But those things do physically exist forever in the blockchain because you can do that. You can literally pay a, a, a certain amount of cryptocurrency, depending on the coin, to create a smart contract to basically inject and link that file in IPFS and replicate it throughout the network. And you, it's in the blockchain. You can't get rid of it. It's there forever. And so that's kind of the sad part about it is there's probably a lot of people that are using the blockchain to do a lot of illegal activities by through these smart contracts, but you can't, but the flip side is if you make it regulated to where everything has to be approved, then you have an approving body and it's no longer as easy centralized and it's lost all well, of its value. It might as well be a credit card. Right. So, so the idea being is you let the blockchain be like the storage of the entire world. And then you let the individuals that put the front ends on the blockchain, like the businesses that are actually pulling for like library, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. Library is an online YouTube streaming service that uses IPFS or whatever and their their crypto coin called lbc and they use that as their streaming platform so when you're watching a video on there you're watching the video coming from multiple bits hosted by computers that are replicated out on the internet and it works really really well but when you search you're not finding a bunch of illegal shit on there because they actually have a layer on top of it that says reject and don't show anything that meets this criteria just like youtube does it still exists in the blockchain if you wanted you could go replicate the blockchain go through it and encode these things out and get all this illegal shit out of the blockchain and there's nothing anybody could do about it but the front end if the, the average way the user is going to go in and interact with the blockchain is not going to have access so think of it this way there's a bunch of illegal shit all over the internet but you know how to get to it because the search engine doesn't give you a url right, right. it's right. the same thing the blockchain still has it in there but there's no way to get to it unless you actually deep and dive you could then also filter what goes into it into the chain how as well well if you're if if you can only if you can filter what comes out of it why could you not 
filter well, the front end the front end would be able to so like if you yeah, went to yeah, yeah like if you went to like the youtube site they could pick what what they're going to allow you to, well they can pick what they're going to allow you to put in it and they're going to pick what you're allowed to take off but you can completely go around them everybody in the cool. world has access to the raw hard drive right right so and like one of the things i did is a friend of mine sent me a link to uh was it not a raven coin he mm-hmm. sends me a link to a Ravencoin transaction linked to an IPFS record. And I open up a site that just lets you look at the Ravencoin blockchain, right? And he tells me which entry in the blockchain to go to. I open it up. It decodes the attachments like the web page does. So you can go over and you can see the attachments to that blockchain token. And I click on it and I open it up. And it's actually like pictures of his his uh, flamethrower, his not a flamethrower with uh-huh. serial numbers and approval and all the data on there. The timestamp saying date of ownership um that he owns it and everything like that so that he can say that if anybody ever stole that and tried to like resell it or so it ever shows up somewhere else in the world he can prove in that blockchain that he owns it yeah. like he has all the pictures and all the paperwork and everything all filed in the in the raven coin blockchain and i was like how much did it cost to put it in there and he's like oh point zero zero two raven coin like the equivalent of like less than two cents yeah that's so. kind of cool man i could this this shit could be something really like like kind of amazing yeah it's changed, like, dude it's changing the world like literally there is talk right now just, that web 3.0 will be blockchain that there will no longer be apache web servers and there will no longer be windows service it will all just be blockchain served everywhere everywhere it'll be anything and wow because you, you can do it you can absolutely do it like that's that's the cool thing about this is basically there, there's no data center of computers that's going to be as powerful as the combined power of every computer on the planet. So if you create a web experience where by opting into that web experience, you become a part of that web experience and you're joining the cloud, kind of like Tor. If you use Tor, yeah. people can go through you as you're going through other people, right? It's like yeah. you can't just well, say, I'm going to use Tor and nobody else can. Because, well, and if you try, well, wouldn't, yeah, like you couldn't, you couldn't create one massive, like, cluster that would be more powerful than everything and if you did wouldn't that wouldn't that also be a part of it like you can't you can't you can't touch it without also affecting it right like so so the idea the idea is is 51 percent of of all of the systems that are that are touching the chain have to agree that yes this is the chain and yeah. and we all agree so it, you yeah you couldn't you couldn't make like there there wouldn't be there couldn't be a bad actor that could make something f- powerful enough to disagree powerfully enough correct right? and, chi- and china's tried china has tried multiple That's times with bitcoin nuts. to create the fastest asics in the world and restrict their export so that china would basically corner the bitcoin market and at no point were they ever even fucking close to be, taking over 51 like, percent take control of the chain because there's just too many other people's authenticating it right and Whoa. then the more people that come online in china that try to corner the network like the more people that come online are yeah. going to complicate the network and it's yeah. going to self-balance and then more people are going to join in to try to take advantage of like you know because because it's going to create more difficulty in the network because there's more people mining so then you have everybody else step up their game like you know mutually assured destruction they're going to throw more power out of it now they just undid everything china did so it's like the self-balancing wheel right like like yeah. no matter what anybody does in the world it's apparent to everybody because everybody's watching the blockchain whenever, whenever they see, you know, a huge amount of power coming onto the blockchain, they're going to react by another part, like another group coming in on top of that. Like they're, they're going to balance it out. And the, and the value of the currency is also going to stimulate people coming in and mining or even just verifying transactions, right? In Bitcoin, you're going to be mining is just going to be transaction verification once the last coin comes online. And, and that's, that's the weird thing I, I, about this is the, the value part. So like where, where does the value of Bitcoin come from? Now we're touching on a little bit of economics. The, so, the same as your dollar and, in your pocket. Somebody has to prove and authenticate that's a real dollar and not a counterfeit dollar, right? So that's that's you. That's your computer. So it, is, it is just the fact that somehow or another we've agreed as a, as a, as a group of human beings, we've agreed that we can exchange this funny bit of information on the internet for fifty six thousand dollars of, exactly. of u.s dollars exactly okay, okay. It, it's so literally it perceived just, per, it, well i mean but fiat currency works the exact same way we don't have a gold yeah, standard it, anymore if everybody no, decides that a dollar is worth 50 cents it's worth 50 cents yeah like if i don't agree that i if i don't agree to to exchange this thing for 50 u.s 
coins, yep. whatever you want to call it, then it's not worth 50 coins. If exactly. you don't want to give me 50 coins for this thing, you you we have to agree on on the exchange. And and that's okay. Okay. Yeah, and it, and the thing is like that's why the value on it changes so much, right? The value changes so much because from day to day the the dependence or the just like with stock, the stock market, right? Right. You you're, you're perceiving something is going to happen. So like let's say Bitcoin gets to $50,000. Everybody's like, "Holy shit, that's a lot more than I thought it was. I'm going to sell all my Bitcoin." And then they sell all their Bitcoin, which floods the market with new Bitcoins, which brings down the overall value of the currency because there's there's less scarcity. There's more of it. So then a bunch of people buy it back because they're like, "Oh my god, it's cheap right now." And then the price goes back up because of the scarcity again. That's that whole pump and dump thing just like the stock market does is there a limit so like is there inflation of bitcoin yes or or or, or are there only so many coins available oh no, no sorry there, there's only so many coins available like at a certain point i don't know the exact date but at a certain point there are no more coins that is it and so now that's why everything's that traded in fraction points. of a coin now that okay so because that would stabilize the value correct because, because then there's a a limited number of these whatever coins yep. these tokens available and so that would then stabilize the value of them because there's only so many to be had exactly just like like the us dollar at one point there was only so many because th it was backed by only so much gold and so once once we stop doing that now it just becomes we can make more dollars and right. and because there's more of them they're worth they're worth less because there's right. more of them and that's exactly why bitcoin goes up so steadily is because <laughs> bitcoin actually did a clever thing that some other coins didn't do. And the clever thing is not only does it have a finite number of coins that go into the world, it halves how many coins go out each cycle. So, so in the beginning of Bitcoin, thousands of coins every 10 minutes were going out. Now it's like one coin is going out like every couple of hours or whatever. And it's going to keep having and having and having until there's no more coins. And that's wow. what gives you that steady climb in value. Whereas if they were just pumping them all out at a thousand a day until the last day, and then they disappeared, that would be too much of a shock to the system. You could potentially, I mean, the mathematics tells us that you could infinitely half halve it. And so at some point, somebody has to stop. You can't, you can't have how, you know, cut it in half anymore. Oh, co correct. Once, once it gets down to like two coins, like, or whatever, then it's going to go down to one coin and then zero there's, it's not going to have a whole coin. Okay. So, so it does, but yeah, I think it's 2030 MD Hofsey said in 2030, the last coin will be released on the Bitcoin network. And then there will never be another coin. Every other person that is mining and operating in Bitcoin will be making money by verifying transactions because you pay like an ATM fee to transmit money on the network. Okay. So to send a Bitcoin to somebody, you have to pay a transaction fee. And that transaction fee is the money that goes to the person, the people that are verifying the transaction. So the more people that are spending and trading Bitcoin across the network, the more money those people are making by verifying those transactions. And it doesn't require any new coins to be generated because you're giving them a percentage you're, of the coin you're sending as the fee. Yeah. You're shaving off a, a exactly. piece. Exactly. That's a great way to say it. you're shaving the gold. That's exactly yeah. what you're doing. Just yeah. infinitely shaving well, the gold. Because I mean, that's how nice hash is paying me for yeah. verifying Ethereum, the Ethereum chain or whatever. Exactly. I'm being paid in, in fractions of a, and and there's a limit to that too because like they say that the a, a satoshi yeah a satoshi is the smallest in the, in the same sense as like a penny is the smallest that you can get in a dollar yeah the satoshi is the smallest you can get out of a shave of a of a bitcoin right because it's not infinite you can't go to like zero to the google place right. one fraction of a coin because if you did the that then you would just overcomplicate the network and it wouldn't the transaction fee wouldn't be viable. So, so it's like a Satoshi would be the lowest amount of value that you could transmit on the network while still paying a transaction fee. That's man, this is some very interesting things. Like, yeah, crypto goes way deeper than just money, dude. Like when, this is what I just started learning here in just the last couple of months is I've been oh. farting around after Wall Street bets. I started learning about these smart contracts yeah. and I started learning about this file system that's distributed Bitcoin like file system that's tied directly to multiple blockchains and how they all tie each other together and validate each other. We're basically creating this web. It's like we are shaping space on the Internet and preparing a whole new Internet that's going to be backed yeah. by crypt, uh, cryptographic networks and distributed uh, blockchains. That's an that's intense. and I, I like the idea that there's only so many like there's a, a trillion bitcoins but that's that's, that's not always the case though because like dogecoin is the weird one right now because dogecoin doesn't have a stopping point it doesn't have in ten thousand new coins are mined every minute 
Okay. So well, how does I mean, it hold its value when there's 10,000 new coins? It's because the value is going up because people are buying it like crazy, but it's more like a fiat currency where it's holding mostly level because just like the dollar bill, right? You can print you, as many you dollars as you want. Two trillion dollars. Like, that's exactly so what? it. Like, it's, that's okay. No, no, that's the thing is that that's what they want Dogecoin to be is the new dollar, right? Because yeah. That's what they're shooting for. Once you get it to $1, it's like you're just printing 10,000 new dollars a minute, but it's still worth a dollar with inflation. Like basically it's just countering the inflation and hovering at a dollar. But the scary thing about that that people are worried about is what happens if the network, like if if people decide that something happens to destabilize or whatever, they start to pull back and it drops, it will free fall on its own. Because unless you have a lot of people transacting and using it, you're not going to counter that 10,000 new coins coming onto the network. But the 10,000 coins also prevent it from doing like Bitcoin, where it climbs up to $50,000 a coin. And that way you have a coin. You can literally trade in like whole numbers. It's like 10 Doge is like $10. Sure. Like that's the goal that they want to shoot for. They don't want, if Doge was worth $50,000, like it wouldn't work. It just economically around the world, it wouldn't work. Yeah. And, but I I see that's, well, but it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be worth it would have to be back. Like I could see where, okay, we're going to get to a point where there's a universal currency. Call it, let's call it Dogecoin, right? But it would be backed by Bitcoin because there's only so many Bitcoins, right? And you would have, you would, you would then say, okay, well, a hundred Dogecoin is only really worth point zero 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 one Bitcoin because there's only so many Bitcoin or whatever. Right. And that exists. And I, that actually and does I think exist. that's that's how it would end up becoming, right? Because if there Bitcoin A is the is the the common name, like everybody knows what it well, it's it's the popular one. And so that's and there's only so many of them. So w- that would likely become the standard, the gold standard yep. of cryptocurrencies, because there's only so many bitcoins. There can't ever be any more. Like, like we could potentially mine more gold. There's probably more gold out there somewhere. Like we had, we definitely haven't pulled it all out of the ground. Yeah. And so that would, that would mess with the value of whatever currency is backed by that. But since there is literally cannot be any more Bitcoin after a certain point, it would be stable forever. Right. As long as people recognize and transact a Bitcoin, it remains secure. Yes. It would be way more stable than a fiat currency. And it'd be globally accepted. You wouldn't have this weird inflation between every other country. It would be worth exactly that amount everywhere. Wow. So yeah, it's, because it's it, really because powerful be, shit, dude. It's like, that's why it's not going anywhere. Stable. Because it isn't backed by anything that actually like exists necessarily. Right. You can't, like I said, you can't make more Bitcoins to, to, to ruin the value of it. There, there will, there will only ever be so much bit. Holy cow. Yeah, and if you try to bring on a counterfeit network or create like a Bitcoin variant like Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin EV or all these other ones, your value is only going to be as good as the people that are willing to transact with that currency and adopt it. If they don't adopt it, it's not going to grow. Most crypto coins die. Sure, fine. Like, you know, there could be a the Chinese coin, right? The Chinese credit, new yen or whatever you want to call it. Like, yep. Dude, I created could. a coin. It's on GitHub. You can go download Barna coin and compile it and mine Barna coins and put it into your little blockchain. But I guarantee you'll be the only person with that blockchain because I stopped doing it a long time ago. But at one point we had like 50 people that That's were mining that Barna coin and actually transacting Barna coin. And it worked like it was basically just a copy of, of Bitcoin. And I just changed a couple things in the code and rebuilt it so that I had new hash and I had my own cryptocurrency. You were saying in 20, 2030, 2030. would be the last Bitcoin? Yep. And then there's going to be whatever, a trillion of them. Yeah. And somebody said, like, what about the like, is it still worth the power to, like, just verify transactions? And yes, the whole idea of Bitcoin is that it's it's self-balancing. So what will happen is everybody will mine to get the verification fees. Now, if the verification fees get less less than the power and the money to mine, so basically it's not profitable anymore. Then what they're going to do is they're going to pull out and stop verifying it, which means verification is going to slow down on the network, which means transactions are going to take longer. And because transactions take longer, that's going to make the value of the currency probably go up because more scarcity and moving stuff around right in volume. And then that's going to raise the price of the cryptocurrency, which means the guys coming back to verify the transactions now are profitable again. And the system's self-balancing. Like, like there's like three elements. There's the people that are verifying the transactions, which are the miners. There's the people that are transacting the coin, right? or the sending the coin and then the recipients of the coin and it works in this circle. And if any of those circles die down, like this person, like everybody's holding onto their coin and nobody's transacting it, that's going to raise the value. If it raises the value, that's going to cre- create more difficulty on the network to verify the transactions, which means now you need more power 
and more stuff to do it. And so then you have more people that are coming on mining and making money that way. And then because they're making so much money from the verification of transactions, they now take control and, and they're making all that money. So then they bring the cost of the network back down again. So so it's like it, it's it's really complicated. Somebody showed me a heat map of it once. I was like, holy shit. But the idea with Bitcoin and why it's so successful is it's all incentivized. If, okay. if, if, if it's not profitable yeah. for you to mine, it's profitable for you to send coins and to receive coins. If it's not profitable to send and receive coins, it's profitable to mine. It's like there's always be, some angle. There would be incentive to to transact the Bitcoin because if like hoarding it, hoarding Bitcoin would lower the value, right? Because if you aren't moving it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Transaction no, volume does hurt value. If, yeah. If there aren't any transactions happening then there's no value because so it no, drops and what happens no, when a stock drops and you don't think it's going to come back no you sell and what happens when you start selling it goes up it goes up <laughs> so it's literally just a it's an endless roller coaster ride but it always in the end but the idea is because the scarcity of the coin and there's less coins out on the network and it becomes more and more of a scarce resource just like anything on earth right when oil becomes scarce the price goes up right so, so the idea is, is to get the scarcity to the point where there's never a new coin, which means only the people that possess coins are the, unless they give them up, the, there's no more transaction. But if they don't give them up, that's going to kill the price on the network. So what you're going to do is have a bunch of people holding onto their coins and, and, and then it's going to start to fall. And then they're all going to shit a brick and try to outsell each other and then try to buy before it spikes up again. And you're just going to get this infinite pump and dump, but that's going to create so much activity on the network that it's going to keep it alive. And there's little shavings going on during all of those transactions. So each time all these guys are selling and buying their coins, buying low, selling high, buying low, selling high, the house is always getting their cut. So everybody huh. so everybody that's that's doing the verifications and keeping the network alive for all these big whales that own all the coins. Well, everybody, really. But the, the people that are keeping it alive ultimately are going to dictate the value, because if it's not profitable for them to mine, they're not going to mine. And if they're not mining, you can't move your coins. And if you can't move your coins, they have no value. So the incentive for the people to come back in and mine again is for the price to go up. But the price is only going to go up if they want to trade their coins. So it's like it's it's so bizarre how it works. But the idea being is the difficulty of the network goes up if there's too many people mining. So less people will start to mine. If there's if there's not enough transactions going on in the network, then the difficulty comes down to get more people to mine to incentivize the currency so that more people are transacting and trading it. And it's that's what makes Bitcoin so beautiful. Now, I'll tell you what Bitcoin sucks at, though, is Bitcoin wastes a lot of power. So so Bit verifying transactions is important in Bitcoin, but it is very power intensive and you're really not doing anything but verifying transactions. That's it. Right. And a lot of it, you're not very, if there's not a transaction to verify and you're mining, you're literally just re generating random numbers and shit and heat into the world. So Bitcoin isn't a good coin long term for mining. It really isn't. That's why it's good that it's going away. Like there's not going to be any new coins. The other cryptocurrencies, right. however, are fantastic to mine because the smart contract system means that every time you're validating a transaction, well, not every time, but when work is available, when you're validating a transaction, you're also running like fucking MIT studies on how to cure cancer. You're 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 putting in, you know, uh, fucking verisign documents and shit into the blockchain to verify certificate authorities. I mean, you're doing all this extra shit while you're mining. So now your computer isn't just senselessly shitting out power to get cryptocurrency. You're being paid for your computer participating in a cloud computing experiment. Yeah. J.A. Cole says something here. He goes, downside of having a hard stop on the number of a coin is that as economy grows and products are produced, you just end up with a coin that exponentially increases in price beyond a usable value. And I, I don't quite understand that. Not really, because the Satoshi will always be at a minimal value. So like, like, like let me give you an example. So how do we still have a penny today, right? It's like we still have a penny, right? Do you know of anything that costs one cent? It's like it's there just to add on a little bit or take a little away, but we still have a penny. You can't give anybody less than a penny using right. U.S. currency. Like they're not going to let you just shave well, off the edge of a penny. In, not in a physical sense. Not in a least. physical sense, using the currency. Well, the same thing applies in Bitcoin is the lowest possible value that you'll ever be able to transact in Bitcoin is still going to be a lot less than what anything is going to cost to do. Yeah. Like in theory, right? And, and if it costs more, if it costs that little, then it makes sense for you to just do a whole bunch of them. Like just yeah. to get up to one Satoshi so that you could actually buy it. So you're not going to end up in a You shouldn't end up in a situation where it's such a small transactable bit that it's worthless, that there's nothing you can buy. Like, like, honestly, it's so expensive that one Satoshi is like three Lamborghini Diablos. Like at that point, then it just becomes a stock. It's like the Apple stock at a thousand dollars and everybody's just trading it for intrinsic value. It stops being a functional currency at that point. But the other thing is you don't really have to worry about that either because you could create another token currency that just like you were saying earlier, where it takes Bitcoin into account, right? 
and you're basically yeah. putting tokens on the back of Bitcoin that is like altering and giving you additional value, but it's a much smaller value and a much use, more usable and speedy value. Yeah, and, and see, that's where I think it would end up is like, it would be it would be almost, or like only, I feel like at a point, only like enormous transactions would occur with actual Bitcoin. Right. Like, like, like the way central banks move $10,000 bills, like, those yeah, it's always going to be a fraction. Like whenever I do a transaction, even in my wallet, like when I go to NiceHash and I want to transfer $100 to my Bittrex, mm -hmm. I just transfer 0 0.0026 something Bitcoin. Right. It would be, and so like, it would be other tokens that, that would actually be like the normal people money. Right. It'd be the, the government. Bitcoin becomes the thousand dollar bill, basically. Yeah, right? Governments would trade in yeah. Bitcoin where humans would, would trade in Dogecoin. Yeah, and what a lot of people do today, like like the smart way to like spend your money if you're doing transactions that are really small, is Bitcoin network fees cost a lot. Sure. Because of the value of Bitcoin and the scarcity of people mining it, just because it's, you know, it's so intensive and requires an ASIC and like you're not going to make any profit doing it yourself. The only way that miners are actually contributing to Bitcoin now is by mining other currencies and then converting it into Bitcoin. Right. So so the mining the Bitcoin itself is like completely like profitless for most people. So, sure. so you mine other coins instead, and then you convert them into Bitcoin. The opposite is true too. So let's say you want to do a bunch of small transactions and you want them to be fast and you don't want to pay a shitload of network fees. What you do is you take your Bitcoin and you sell it and you transact with one network fee, you transact that into a smaller coin that's yeah. more manageable, like Ethereum, right? Ethereum's yeah. on the rise too, but still Ethereum compared to Bitcoin is like what? Like one, one fourth, well, one quarter. Yeah. So then you put it in Ethereum and then Ethereum, you have faster verification, right? So, so you can move money quicker. And the network fees are lower. So you take one blob of, of Bitcoin, pull it out and stick it into Ethereum, then go spend all your Ethereum where you can spend Ethereum and yeah. you're good to go. And then, then you can, and if you need a smaller currency than that, then go buy some fucking Doge that's worth like, you know, $1 is zero point, you know, or, or you know, 5,000 coins or whatever is is a dollar. Well, not really. I think it's like what it is up to now, like two, two cents or four cents. Still, you get my point though. You can buy like 20 of them for a dollar, right? So right. you just buy a currency that's of a lesser value using that crypto transact in that lesser currency those would be like the pennies like that's the penny right. currency bitcoin's the thousand dollar bill currency and as long as they have enough profitability that the world stays engaged and smart contracts are great because now now you don't have to worry about the miners just getting bored and going oh man trying to build really fast asics fuck this we're out we're not going to mine anymore now it's like they're creating cryptocurrencies that are very gpu heavy and i and gamers hate this obviously and i understand why but they're specifically creating algorithms that don't work well with asics because the whole idea of preserving the network is get as many real individual people decentralized as possible mining and not just have giant mines of asics that are built just for mining in china yeah. taking over an entire network and you're doing real work so you so now you don't have to feel bad about burning a bunch of electricity you are doing real work with your computer isn't there is a bit of a benefit though to having those giant ASICs authenticating all of those transactions, right? Because it it helps the that transfer of value, right? Yeah. yeah. And so Bitcoin's like at, at really some, slow. Yeah, so dude. Bitcoin is at, stupid slow. It takes like fucking point, 45 minutes or an hour for me to move Bitcoin from one wallet to another. Right, because of that transaction has to be okayed by everybody and on there's the chain. So, yeah, and there's so many transactions or fractions of Bitcoins being thrown around now that it's like it takes forever to get the verifications. But That's there's some why currency I it's only fast. Get paid out by nice hash every four exactly. hours. Exactly. And plus network fee, right? They would rather you accumulate enough that when they transact all those currencies into Bitcoin, the network fees they're paying are really low. Man. Uh, that's this is kind of a, a Man, it won't be it won't be dollars anymore. It'll be U.S. coin yeah. or whatever. Because whether you, you know, whether you transmit like one bit like one bitcoin or zero 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 nine bitcoin, you're still paying your two dollars or whatever the current value is for the network fee. So yeah. so it makes more sense for you to accumulate a big shitload so that your network fee is like an incredibly infinitesimal small part of the transaction versus doing a bunch of tiny transactions that just eat it up with network fees. So it's like using an ATM. Here, so. Like if you go to an ATM, you're not going to pull out twenty bucks. If there's a three dollar fee, you're gonna pull out a hundred bucks, and then you go to the ATM less frequently. That's the yeah, same thing with Bitcoin transaction fees. So Clayman here says like point zero 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 four three four numbers like that are not human friendly, right? But that's why you would have a secondary coin that is one one U.S. dollar, which is a an actual NFT, is is equal to point zero 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 four three Bitcoin. Because there's yeah. only so many Bitcoin. Yeah. And I believe that's and how tokens work. Value. 
So I think token coins work that way. Like a token coin is like, we're going to buy up this amount from the blockchain and we're going to represent it in our own coin, right? It's fractions of that Bitcoin in our own coin. And then you become a token on top of that. And now, now you're one value, which is still going to fluctuate. You're never going to keep sure. it at exactly one US dollar. The Satoshi is a moving target, right? So, so, but the other cryptocurrency is going to be closer to a more human friendly number. And then what you do is you try to create that token in such a way that if that value starts getting out of control or whatever, that you can like basically bring it into check. Like, like you'd basically, I don't know, sell some of the value back or something like that, or create another token coin on top of that one. I mean, it, that'd get pretty annoying to have 5,000 coins, but that's honestly where we're headed right now. I mean, there are a lot of coins. Yeah, but man, that's kind of cool. I feel like you just have to get, you'd have to get the banks and to. Oh, and there's another thing too, is you don't have to trade. This is another. Oh, actually, I think this is going to clear a lot of things up from the confusion. You do not have to transact in 0.0000034 Bitcoin. You don't have right. to do that. You can literally say at this moment in time, I want my product to be worth $10. And then based on the value of cryptocurrency, that value changes. So you still go to the site and you say, okay, I'm going to pay you $10. So you put $10 into the box and it factors out at current market value what Bitcoin, what $10 of Bitcoin is, and it transacts that. So you never have to do it. Like when I transfer money from one place to another, I just say, hey, transfer 100 bucks at whatever it's worth into this other cryptocurrency. I don't do the 0, 0. 0, you know, 0. 0. 0. 0. Right. Bitcoin crap. It, it, it's the same way that like, um, dude, I got to well, like, I'm going to piss exchanges myself. Work. I'll be right back. Right? <laughs> Old man, like, damn it. I imagine, at least I imagine that's how... It would be very similar to how currency exchanges work now. Like my my one dollar US is actually only worth eighty five cents in the UK, right? Man, USDT is supposed to be backed by enough physical dollars to control its value, but US US inflation is nuts. They would they just print more print more money all the time. I think Jerry needs a prostate check. Nah. But then, yeah, you're saying like taxes. Well, the, it, the tax, the tax, the government would take a the the tax on a U.S. like say a U.S. government coin. Um, the tax would be that transaction fee. They're taxing you for every transaction you do. It'd be a sales tax in a sense. It would be a a, a almost a not global, but it would be a, a countrywide sales tax. For what? Yeah, sorry, man. I had to do the bladder oh, thing. Give me a so TLDR. They were, they were talking about um, government poops when they can't collect taxes. Well, if 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 the U.S. government decided to mint, I, I don't think that's the right word, but if the U.S. government decided to to change the dollar over to a cryptocurrency, their, your tax would be the transaction fee. the the uh, The government would take the transaction fee in order to, right or they wouldn't they, could. Be able, they wouldn't be able to though because they're not well, going to be able to prove that you own the wallet they're, they're they may not even be able to prove the recipient who took the money that sent you the thing even did it it'd be a phantom transaction the only way they'd be able to do it is if they forced you like for from but you can do this already with real money right like i can come over and just hand you a thousand dollars in cash the government doesn't know about it right you don't have to declare that you technically you're supposed to declare it over a certain amount you don't have to if i just hand it to you and neither one of us say anything the right. government doesn't know. So the way the government gets their taxes with cryptocurrency is they create they, they basically create laws like here in Washington. There's only certain exchanges that can operate here, like Bittrex is one of them. Uh, Coinbase can operate here, but a lot of them can't because you have to agree to the laws for state level and federal level and, you know, for your country. And so so I have a wallet through an actual institution and anything that I transact through that institution is tracked just like a bank. And I get a tax document at the end of the year yeah. and they take their cut of every bit of money coming in and every money, bit of money going out like That's like. So, so it's just like a bank. It's exactly like a bank account. So, the, so the idea being is that when you go to a bank and you put your money in, at the end of the years, you get, you know, your dividend statement, the money goes into your account. The IRS is notified of that. So if you have like a billion dollars coming to your account and they don't see taxes paid on that, they can audit you, right? And come after you. They know it goes into your bank. Same thing with crypto. If you're working with an online exchange that does the tax stuff for you, you do have to pay that money. Like the IRS is going to audit you if they see you deal a billion dollars of cryptocurrency and you don't claim it on your taxes. It yeah. will create a discrepancy because Coinbase is going to narc you out. Bittrex is going to narc you out. And legally so. You And the thing is, right. you want that because if you have a private wallet on your hard drive and you're transacting all this money, and at some point you sell it from your wallet and you put it into your bank account, you're still going to have to pay taxes on that. 
Like you might think you're being all clever and shit by going, oh, I have my own wallet and everything's anonymous. And whenever I want to turn it into money, you're still going to be taxed that's, on the second. You, yeah. That's when you'll get it. Right? Like you, you said, like at US some dollar. point, it's all well and good until you attach it to your, until exactly. something happens to your personal identification. Exactly. And so like it's, which essentially, which I mean, hey, in, in more and more as we are dealing in digital transactions, like, that's another digital. reason why people mine too. Actually, that's that I forgot to bring that up. So, so what what's another reason to make people mine when it's not profitable? You want phantom dollars. You want untraceable oh, currency. Yeah. So if for, if, I, for if I mine assets. Yeah, so if I mine directly, if I'm if I'm mining directly on the chain, I'm not pool mining through somebody's pool. I'm mining my crypto on there and I accumulate a thousand of some shitty coin. And it gains some value. And then I transact that from that wallet into a new currency. There is no paper trail leading back to me. And as long as I only use that account to buy things with crypto or to sell things with crypto, and I never transacted into U.S. currency, yeah. that is technically at that point untraceable. Sure. But if I fuck up and I one time and, and somebody buys some shit from me with crypto and I mail something from my house to oh. them and forensics come online and somebody gets interested and they go back and say, oh, you, you this money went from this account to this account. We got this guy and he rolled over and said that you're the wallet he got it from. And this is where the package came from and where it went to. They got you. And then they can go back and, and marry everything else together through time. Ah, so it's massively cool. traceable. Like the whole the whole thing that oh, cryptocurrency is anonymous. It, it just like with a VPN, it is if you understand every single thing you're doing. And but if you get lazy, it, it's not. And you you have to keep it within the bounds of the system. Correct. Like once once you start touching it to another, that's yep. when they can. Yeah, like if you wanted to buy. sell, let, let's say you wanted to sell crypto for real money and you wanted to keep it off the books. The way that you would do it is you just go on like Facebook under like an anonymous account you created with a fake Gmail through a VPN and be like, hey, meet me in a dark alley behind Sears and I'm going to sit there with my phone and transfer these coins into your wallet and you give me a bag of money. And now you got a bag of money that's untraceable, right? Because, right. but, and if they catch that guy, he doesn't know who you are because you just met him. You never traded names. He doesn't know where you live. He doesn't know your phone number. You had a mask on or whatever. You do that dirty deal. And that's the only way that you could do it and, and technically stay anonymous and have US dollars from a cryptocurrency. So uh, let's, we're gonna, we only got a few more minutes, but like, let's say the whole system, all money is now cryptocurrency. How would that transaction work? Would I then have to like, I would hand you like a USB stick with a, with a, a an anonymous wallet on it. Right. Yep. It'd be the same with dollars. I walk up and just hand you a thousand dollar bill and don't tell nobody. And so it would, there was still, so I would have to, I'd have like a, a little USB stick yep. that, that somehow or an, either I built it or something, whatever, something that, that something physical that isn't necessarily tied to exactly Correct. back to me personally that I then put a, uh, uh, and it's a wallet on its own. It's a, you know, it's hell the, the fucking serial number of the USB stick itself. Yeah. I don't know. It might be, tra you could track it back to Samsung or whatever, but uh, whatever. Um, right. It's all they that could track, well, they could track who bought the stick originally, but at some point I could, I, you know, Tim handed it to me. He bought it from fucking Amazon. Yeah, you could have bought it at a garage that, sale. That, yeah, that transaction. But if I had somehow came into possession of the stick, I could put whatever coin, I, whatever cryptocurrency on it yep. and say, this is a verified va worth, you know, a thousand Bitcoin because that's the stable currency. Yep. Here you go. Mm -hmm. You take that USB stick. You could stick it into your computer, transfer that wallet value to your personal wallet yep. on the. Yeah. Okay. Not only that, I literally have. Somewhere in my Shadow. house, I, I need to find them because I think if, if I think one of them might be worth a Bitcoin, like I'll have to check. But like 10 years ago, I had these little gold coins that somebody gave me that have NFC chips in them. Hey, and the NFC you. chip is linked to each each coin that was made is linked to a Bitcoin wallet. And the NFC chip has the private key for the wallet. So you basically scan it on your phone with an app. You go do it and, it and it pulls up your wallet or the blockchain and shows you that value in it. You can transfer in or transfer out. You can add more money to the coin if you want and have a physical coin in your pocket that's your Bitcoin wallet. So and I can hand that to you like I can physically go there and say, oh, here's here's a here's a coin that has this value. But that value is put on that coin by somebody else. So I have no fingerprints like on it. I'm holding it with a glove. I give it to you. You hand me back a big bag of money and it's like good luck finding me. And all that money is untraceable. It's basically laundering money. That's laundering money, right? You're literally laundering currency at that point. 
But at some point, you're going to be able to just buy shit. With, I mean, Bitcoin is already widely accepted in a lot of places. Hell, you can you can get a Pornhub subscription with uh, Doge right now. Like, de- <laughs> literally, they're accepting Doge for, for like, I mean, premium. So, so cryptocurrency is becoming more widely adopted. But the thing yeah. that's going to make cryptocurrency stick around is not just, like, stocks, like, with its perceived value, which would have been enough on its own. But it's the fact that all cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin, well, not all, but most of them, are now GPU mined. Most of them, like you don't have these ASIC, this ASIC problem where China's trying to corner the market or whatever. So a GPU around the world. And the other thing is they're doing real work. And as long as real businesses are paying those transaction fees and paying those smart contracts to do this work for them so that they don't have to build these big, huge data centers to do processing that they can do in seconds by just paying a couple of Ethereum, uh, they're going to do that. And that's going to keep the network alive. So cryptocurrency is literally like this entire digital world of value that is happening across work that's being done. Like, you know, people mining shit and getting paid to mine ore out of the ground. You're literally getting paid for giving your CPU cycles to some dude that wants to use your computer for a couple of seconds to run a theory or a, or run a simulation or something mm. or a partial simulation. Pretty crazy shit, man. Huh? Yeah. This it's very, very interesting to see where the future of this is going to go. Yeah. That's why I'm in crypto now. It's, it's not necessarily for the money. I mean, the money's cool. Cause I like that, you know, money makes everything a little more exciting, but I'm in crypto just cause how crazy it is. Like, it's just a neat thing. I like, so, uh, James Martinez here says a lot of misinformation going on here. Anyone that wants to get into crypto seriously just needs to do their own a hundred percent. So obviously, but yeah, just like I wouldn't trust James Martinez because that comment pretty much shows that well, he's not a person that can be trusted either. So I'd well, say do your own research. It depends on what he means on where what going no, no, on. No, no, no. Broad statements like that. Houston, broad well, no, no. broad statements like that. Fuck him. No, oh. I, I do not stand for that shit. If you wanted to say specifically what we got wrong and offer something, but basically to say, oh, this is a lot of misinformation. This is all wrong. I've done my research. I do cryptocurrency. You may not agree with me and you can have that argument, but to be an, an asshole like that in what? chat? No, fuck you. Go do See, your I, research. I, I always tell people to do their research. I take a, a benign intent angle. <laughs> Jer, jury assumes you're being a dick. I'm I'm more curious about what you meant by going on here in the chat because I haven't really been paying attention to chat or between my myself and Jerry. But that leads me, and I'll I hundred percent. I don't know a lot about this, but it does lead me to want to bring on like Bitsby Trippin or something. Oh, I'd to, love to bring him you know, on. He's actually he's actually the person I consult on everything. To get a better understanding of all of this, because like this seems very like world altering. No, it absolutely is world altering. This is this is here to stay. If, if again, if I'm understanding this correctly, again, if there's only so many bitcoins that makes it a stable currency because there's only so many that value comes from the scarcity there's only so many bitcoin to go around so that it, in my mind as far as my very very basic understanding of economy works if there's only a trillion bitcoin and we all say that that those bitcoin are are of value then it is a stable currency. It is a stable value because there's only so many. You can't make any more. There, I assume you can't destroy any, right? Like you can't just make them go away. Right. So, I mean, you could hoard them. You could stack them up, obviously creating more scarcity. But if there's only so many of a thing, again, that's why we were on the gold standard, right? Is because there was only so much gold that, that was in a box somewhere a theoretical metaphorical box. And so no, no, no scarcity doesn't make it valuable. The, the agreement that a thing is of value is what makes it valuable. It's all a social contract. Uh, 100%, our, our, that's one value. Again, it's all, it all, it all comes back to bartering. Really? I agree that this cup, me and Jerry agree that this cup is going to be worth that LED sign to him. If I create a bunch of if I create a bunch of cups and and everybody's like, "Man, I want a fucking Barnacles LED sign and all Jerry wants are these cups." That's what it's worth. You know? That's literally what the def- like same thing in the stock market. The the value that you see like when it says this is how much you can sell your stock for, that has nothing to do with the company. That has nothing to do with the transaction. That's just what it happens to be trading on average at between people. Like people are buying and selling. GameStop is the perfect example. Massively. The great okay. example. And we're gonna we're gonna 
burn out our our fuse here but people, people <laughs> this one's saying, worth burning it out for people are saying oh there's no way gamestop is worth four hundred dollars you're absolutely right it's not it's not worth four hundred dollars to you but there are enough people out there who are willing to agree that a piece of the of the GameStop company is worth four hundred dollars, and they are willing to exchange a certain medium of exchange, whatever. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar or a fucking piece of rice. the 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 method of exchange isn't important. It's the perceived value, right? Like I feel like. I feel like that is the truth of all economics. We all agree, like the the value of a dollar is the faith that we have that the U.S. government can pay back its debts. Yeah, that's that is that's and the, the other thing the is like value of a dollar. Yeah, is, the reason GameStop is worth four hundred dollars is like to your point that you're making. The reason it's worth four hundred dollars, even the person buying it for four hundred dollars doesn't think it's worth four hundred dollars. They just notice that it's going up because everybody's buying it, and that's creating a massive lean in the direction. And because they're buying it, the price is going up. People want to get in on it. They don't want to be left behind, so they're paying more and more and more. And eventually, the, somebody's gonna get screwed when it pops, and that always the, happens for everything. The reason that the value can fluctuate is because there's only so many pieces of the GameStop company available. Correct. Correct. The volume. There's there right when a when a or company market goes, cap, yeah. when a when a when a company goes public, they say we're going to release a million pieces of our company to be traded. And and the a group of people come to enough enough people come together to say each piece of this company is going to be worth a hundred grains of rice, right? It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the symbol isn't important. It's the agreement of its value that it's, that is important. I don't care if you're, if you're going to give me, if you're going to give me a brick and I'm going to give you a stock of GameStop, I've agreed that that piece of, of GameStop is worth this brick. It doesn't matter if it's a dollar. It doesn't matter if it's a, a leaf off the ground. It, the, the, the physical thing isn't important here. It's the, the agreement, the social contract, that it is worth something. And we can start going into how currency all ends up being a representation of time and effort and labor. Yeah, we're just like, not trading things directly, right? It's like, I'm not giving you a chicken for you to, like, build me a barn. It's like universal right. money. I can pay anybody any number of value to do anything for me. Even still, at that point, at that point of trade, right? I've I've agreed that the time it took me to build that barn, the material to to harvest the materials, to plane the wood, to put it together, I've agreed that the the that labor is is equal to the the amount of effort you put into raising that chicken. Yeah. That's, that's a really good way to look at it. It's like basically you're just it's always time and labor and effort. Yeah. Always. That's what it always would have been. So, and it's, it's the same for the Bitcoin, right? It's a, except instead of human effort, it's it's electrical power and effort. It's the effort it took to verify the chain. I agree that the time it took me to say, yep, that transaction is legitimate, is worth a certain amount of exchange. Right? Yeah. Like, I, I'm... <laughs> I'm no economics major, but I, I feel like that's that in its is... simplest, like, like in its absolute rock bottom simplest. That's what it is. It, it's all perceived value. Even your dollar, like, like I said earlier, it's like, you know, I saw the, the, the same guy in chat or whatever earlier was like running off like, oh, Bitcoin is not a stable currency. Neither is fucking fiat currency. Dude, we print off however much we fucking want. There's no gold standard for it. Like your gas could cost twice as much in a day. Minimum wage can double. Like every single thing can change the value of that one dollar. But that's what I mean, though, right? Is if there's only so many Bitcoin, then the value would only fluctuate when people start hoarding it. But if they start hoarding it, it becomes less valuable because right. you need you, the, 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 the if value. If there's only one guy that can build your barn, right? If there's only one guy that can build your barn, he can pretty much charge you whatever the fuck he wants if you need a barn. But if nobody wants to build the barn, then, right? Or no, no, that that's taking it. Into, that's not quite right. But like. Yeah, you the 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 it has to be transacted for there to be value. Yeah, because, because and it's always going to be the comes from the the verification. 
it'll right? always be worth the well not really but it'll always be worth the least amount somebody's willing to sell it for to trade it for to trade it yeah exactly sell it's not the right term because you are trading i mean you literally like even if you give somebody bitcoin trading. you're trading that bitcoin to them for something well, and it's, it's it's like it's like csgo skins it totally is. This all comes back to CSGO skins. I, I, swear I to God. could give you a CSGO skin and you could give me <laughs> a, a key to another game. Yeah. That game is worth whatever. It doesn't matter. X. And yeah. They should literally just, just cut out the middleman and create CSGO coin. Where the skins are just linked to a token that has value. But, and then you can just exchange it and sell it on cryptographic networks. And, and that there too. Like <laughs> the, the value of a CSGO skin is in its scarcity. There's only, you only can ever get, it's not, not that there's only so many skins, but the, 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 the likelihood of you getting whatever the rainbow fucking flip knife is very slim, which makes it scarce which means it's worth more to the people who want it. They're willing to give you more. Bingo. Whatever. It doesn't matter what they want to give you. The value is in the desire for it. And I'm willing yep. to give you. And only as much as you're willing to accept. As yeah, look well. at the not a flamethrower, man. Elon Musk's not a flamethrower. 500 of them. They sold for $500. They're serial numbered and have a C, 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 C of A. Certificate authenticity. And now they sell on eBay for $2,500 to $3,500. And you're like. Well, wait, that's it, you. You could go build that thing. It's literally just an airsoft shell with mostly off the shelf parts. Like you can build something that's a pretty convincing replica of it for, I don't know, $150, $200. And they're selling for 25 to 300. It's not because you can make something that's just as good, if not better. It's because there was only 500 originally licensed Elon right. Musk flamethrowers that were blessed, even though they use third party parts to build them. There's nothing super special about them. They get that kind of money for them. And because of that scarcity is why people are willing to pay that amount of money. Right. Because they know that it's investment. They buy it. People are going to blow up those flamethrowers or fucking throw them in the garbage or not know what they're worth. And get pretty soon there's only 10 left in the world. And now suddenly it's worth a million dollars, even though it's like the shittiest flamethrower ever. And it's just a gimmick and kind of fun. But only because somebody's willing to give That's you a exactly million it. dollars for it. Yep. Like the, all it takes is like one person coming out and saying, oh, man, these flamethrowers were used in like a fucking homicide or something. And and the value could just plummet no, down no, to nobody nothing. Wants like, nobody uh -huh. wants it. It's stigma. It's like it's like it's like Nazi memorabilia. Yeah, you could probably find that crazy guy that like wants it. Like you know, he's got like his little hidden basement or whatever. But but no, you're not going to just put that up on eBay. Like most markets aren't even going to let you sell it because it's too offensive. So mm -hmm. then it loses value. It's not worth as much. But you might find the right guy that wants yeah. to give you a fucking million dollars for it because he can't find it anywhere else, right? So, but again, you got to find that guy, and you want more people. The more people that want it. And the less people that have it, the value goes up because if everybody wants it, then it's a bidding war. So everything's like an auction too, in a in a way, right? In a sense. <laughs> <laughs> or are we out of? Oh yeah, we're out of time. Yeah, we're out of time. Man, we we hit it. That was. I mean, we we were supposed to talk about crypto art and and its verification and authenticity, but we went down a hole. Well, no, I mean, it kind of all ties together, though, right? I mean, we, I I think ending it with just value for money. That's what it is. Like you are collecting a piece of art. It is cryptographically yours. Nobody else can take it. If they if they copy it and put it in their blockchain, you can still prove that 100% without a shadow of a doubt, you are the actual owner of it. Yeah. I think that's pretty cool. I think I, that's I, neat. Oh, another thing I want to say too is just because I chewed that fucker out earlier because I saw I also saw the shit that he was tweeting before that. So um, I want you guys well, to do your research. I'm still learning this myself, but right. to just simply dismiss, this is what pissed me off is when people come and do that whole, oh yeah, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. No, tell me, correct me, fix it. Tell me what's wrong. Give me an alternate point of view. Don't come in here and do that bullshit. I will fucking punch you. <laughs> I know, I know Houston doesn't agree with me on this. I know, hey. but I, I get it, dude. I get it. But I am yes, so over house. this shit live streaming for a living where you get these sanctimonious pricks coming in here. It's like, oh, I know so much more about crypto and you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. It's like that guy walking in Best Buy being like, oh, it's all about the format. Like, what the fuck are you talking about, dude? I, you don't even know who I am or what I was talking about. You're just walking around trying to be a sanctimonious <laughs> asshole. Give me info. And you catch me, me on a, you catch me on a day and I'm, I'm the same. Yeah, I'm no, this, same. today, today is definitely my, I'm, I'm, I'm literally going to go change my pad after the show. So <laughs> <laughs> I try to be the, the counterpoint to, yeah. So, but I do want, I just wanted to make that clear to everybody. I do want you to do your research because I am, I am learning this shit and it is massively complicated. And I, and I, I'm the same way. Look, I, I, I tend to speak with authority, with a confidence that, that lends a certain sort of trust, but do not 
do not ever just take my word anybody for it. I, even if it's something that I feel I'm an expert at, do your due diligence. Do not just trust me or anyone for that matter. Critical thinking is important. Yep. Trust, but verify. And if you tell somebody's wrong, tell them why they're wrong. I would appreciate that, it. That 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 that's my trigger, man. You want my fucking triggers where it's like, oh, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. It's like, what are you talking about, dude? I just talked about it for like 15 minutes. Who says you fucking know what you're talking about? You haven't even said anything. It's like, no, speak if, if you're good, back it yeah. up. Back it, it up. It would have been nicer to say, hey guys, I think you're a little wrong on this. Check this out. This will give you more information. I would Agreed. you could have even said, Man, there's a lot of misinformation going on here. You guys ought to read this, go to this place. You guys got to read this and kind of get a little but better. But him not saying what misinformation is leads everybody to have to just guess what's misinformation and what is it. It's like, no, you have to be specific. Like if somebody says a thousand things right and they say one thing wrong, you don't go, oh, man, there's a lot of shit wrong with what you just said. I mean, then people are like, what the fuck's wrong? Like, I got to go research all thousand things to figure it out. It's like, no, just don't be a prick. That's all I'm saying. Don't be a dick. Be we... feedback. What's that? Be constructive with your feedback. There you go. I like that. And on that note, guys, we will see you again next week. Same bad time, same bad place. I think David's going to be joining us next week. He just had to step out uh, for some for some family stuff. Uh, so 10 a.m. Pacific time here, Barnacle's YouTube channel. Also, you can find us over on Twitch doing our live streams throughout the week. You can find all the links to that in the video description, and we will catch you guys next time. Oh, and thank you for all the super chats, guys. It's been fucking awesome. And Project R3D team, I will get in touch with you about that 3D printer once I get like cruising on my 3D printing.